We're live. Happy Monday, everybody. Today is June 25th, 2018. This is MMA Junkie Radio's pre-show, the show, before the actual show. I am Goz, that's Gorgeous George, that's Dan Tom, and the voice you hear in your ears, that is Danny Okers, the producer in Nueva York. How is everybody Hi. doing? Uh, much better that uh, these uh, internet things seem to take a couple seconds to lay. I got scared for a second, but we're looking good. Yeah? We yeah. are? Well, we're up and running, and we're looking really ni- nice and clean here on our, our YouTube minutes. channel. Thank you for joining Two us. Minutes. I'm on YouTube, and I don't see it. Yeah? I don't see it either. I'm on YouTube also. Mm, took a couple seconds and just came up for me. Are you guys on our on our channel there, our YouTube channel? You see it? We're wearing the stuff we're wearing today and what I'm seeing, so I know I'm not doing a Back to the Future. Okay. All right. I don't like Back to the so Future. So here's the deal, folks. Mm-hmm. What? We are going to change up the production for the time being. You can't catch us on Facebook any longer. Oh. And if you're on YouTube, then you know that because you're there. But if from time to time you use Facebook, don't bother because we're only going to be on YouTube for the time being. Don't ask me for how long or why. Changes today. It's just stuff regarding production That's value. Immediately noticed. In fact, there's many changes come uh, headed your way. Ah, many's not the right word. There's changes headed your way, and slowly but surely, we will fill you in on what those changes Coming are. Up in a minute. And like Danny says, we're coming up on one minute. And we have Goz and Dan trying to figure out what on earth is happening. But today we'll talk to Ben Folks. We'll also have John Morgan in studio. Where is John? We'll cover the latest he's news late. and talk think? about UFC Fight Night 132. I don't know. Uh, he's pulling a George, walking in right as <laughs> as the uh, <laughs> curtain opens. This is even closer than a George. It is, yeah. He's got 20 seconds. He does. I don't know. Oh, I know. Because John Morgan right now is probably at the weigh-ins for the Dana White Contender Series, episode um. 11 of season 2. No, episode 11 overall or season 2, episode 3. Yeah. You know, All right, whatever. stand by. Coming up. Not like it's that important, right? This is your captain speaking. We are making our descent into Las Vegas McCarran Airport. On behalf of all of us, we'd like to thank you for flying MMA Junkie Airlines. Now please fasten your seatbelts and put your tray tables in your upright position because the descent is going to be a little bit bumpy. <laughs> Hi, right, Junkie Nation. It's time to roll, baby, on MMA Junkie Radio with gorgeous George and Gold. This is what we do and why we do it, baby. All night long. We roll it! Yes! The MMA Junkie Radio Revolution is upon us. Can you dig it? There's no escape. No escape. Through the vast frontier of cyberspace and through a sea of stars in outer space. One small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. We've solidified our combat communications stranglehold. We are controlling transmission. With the use of MMA Junkie Radio and Sirius XM satellite radio technology. MMA Junkie Radio. Commence transmission. Live from MMA Junkie Radio HQ in the fight capital of the world. Las Vegas, Nevada. Here are your hosts, Gorgeous George and Goes. From the bike capital of the world, inside the beautiful Mandalay Bay Racing Sportsbook, you are listening to the MMA Junkie Radio Show, the only show that matters. I'm your host, Gorgeous George. With me, as always, is the devious and dastardly Goes. To my left, oh, our East co-host. To my left, the fight analyst, Dan Tom. Back East, handling all the producing duties, Danny Otto. What's up? Good morning. Good morning. So we got here early to figure out some stuff, and I think right now we're figuring out some stuff. We ask that you bear with us, but I'll summarize it as quick as we can. We will be broadcasting on YouTube uh, for the time being, YouTube only. If anyone's catching us in in any other fashion and you have caught us on Facebook, that will no longer be the case for the time being as we sort things out. I was saying on the pre-show, we're going to have some changes we're making some changes. Nothing too radical yet. 
and maybe nothing too radical at all. Who knows? Which a lot of things that we've been doing as a group, brainstorming ideas, things like that, and slowly but surely we'll we'll introduce them. In the meantime, today is Monday, June 25th, and we're here to uh, recap UFC Fight Night 132, which took place this past Saturday in Singapore. Also, we'll cover the latest news. We'll take your calls, 866-522-2846, and react to all the latest news that has popped up in our sport in the last 72 hours since we last saw you on uh, Friday. I'm not sure that we finished covering PFL 2, which also took place, and something we've been really excited about these last few weeks, so we can always touch on that. The World Cup is now, gosh, I want to say they're 10 days in. Right, guys? It started on the 14th. Today's the they're about 11 days in. Some teams, some countries have already been eliminated, and they're going home. Others are fighting for a spot, but basically... We're almost done with what's called group play. Eventually, we'll get to those single eliminations. I've loved it so far. Unfortunately, Peru is no longer involved. So, Viva Mexico. We're somewhat involved. Peru? For another day. Yeah, yeah. But we won't progress to the next round. And that's that. Also, another thing outside of MMA that's happening that I'm really looking forward to is this is the summer of LeBron. Word on the street is that he's going to wind up with the Lakers, but we'll see. There's other suitors, other possibilities, so. We'll have to wait and see. He's kind of like the big figure. I think once he moves, others will react. There's names like Paul George out there and Kawhi Leonard, and it's going to shake up the NBA, but this isn't an NBA show. But I'm an MMA fan who happens to like MMA, so take that. Baseball's closing in on their uh, all-star game. Good for them, right? Just means we're halfway closer to the damn playoffs. And then we can crown a champion there. I lost my excitement for baseball years ago. It's the best I can do. Hockey pulled me in a little. They threw out that line and reeled me in. Great season by our Vegas Golden Knights. So here we are. Summer's just, this is the way it is. You know what I mean? But one thing that's going to happen, we're getting ready to turn the page, is International Fight Week is going to take place. It's not this week. It's the following week. Now, this week we have the Dana White Contender Series to keep us busy. There is no PFL. There is a Bellator at the end of the week. And then the following week is International Fight Week. There will be no Dana White Contender Series that week. But there will be a World MMA Awards night, a Hall of Fame night for the UFC, a Tough 27 finale, and UFC 226. So it's going to be pretty crazy here. But I think we're still... We're not in those waters just yet. We're on the beach. Perhaps we're prancing around with water up to our ankles, seeing if the water's cold or if it's warm. We're not all the way there yet, though. We're just prancing around on the beach. But it's coming, and they have a really great card. Now, John Morgan, today will be the only day he joins us, but he is finishing up, if I'm not mistaken, over in across town at the Palms. The fighters are weighing in. There's only 10 of them. None of them have ever missed weight, by the way. No. All right. It's got to happen eventually. Well, that's right? just a stat that was out there. I saw a story. None of those have ever missed weight. So Only one guy needed an additional hour. John's right? there, like and he'll shoot on straight over here. It's the only day he'll join us this week, so that's why we're not going to have too many guests. We're going to talk to Ben Folks, another one of our writers, and we're just going to discuss. So, again, a great opportunity for you all to call in, participate in the show. I think, at least with me, I'm still on this whole, I'm not feeling Dana White on the 4 p.m. weigh-ins. He said as soon as possible. That means this bad boy could take place during the tough finale and UFC 226. That right there would be... Uh, I, it won't be welcomed by those fighters, and it's going to be a big, big topic, and I'm hoping the fighters push back because without going on record, I just, through social media and through my conversations on and off the record that I have with fighters, no one's told me they prefer 4 p.m. Only a few have said, well, I'll make weight whenever they want me to. 
but most 95% have gone out of the way to say, I prefer the morning weigh-ins. Question is, how far in advance would these fighters need to know that that switch is being made? You know how fighters are, creature of habit. A lot of them like to plan things out to a T. I know it just sounds like a minor tweak, just a few hours, but it doesn't really work like that for a fighter. Like a lot of things need to be switched up. So what is the latest amount of time that you could hear that news and make proper adjustments? I'd say I think there. most fighters will tell you, well, if you're just giving me the additional hours, I'll make way for sure because I was already planning on making it that morning. But mm -hmm. I'd have to go up and down and see how many veteran fighters we have on those fight cards. Heavyweights. But I would say that if you've had 10 fights in the UFC, you're familiar with the deal. And you're also familiar with Las Vegas and what, what you have here in terms of saunas and treadmills and Anything else you need help? Remember you and I saw Matt Hughes running on the street? No, Sean Strick, wasn't it? No, it was Matt Hughes. We saw Matt Hughes once. And we were just driving down the strip on our way to do the show. And Matt Hughes was, he had like a one more round brown uh, uh, foot hoodie on mm -hmm. and sweats. And he was just using the Las Vegas heat. Today I think it's going to be 107. So uh, this is the one city that if you're going to make the switch and do it with short notice, I think fighters will be able to adapt. But I want to do one quick breakdown of, of how that works. But let me ask you a question. Kay. Are we good to go here? Are we? Yeah, yeah. We, we are? are? Uh, little adjustments here and there. So what's happening? Yeah. Why, why can't I? Try it again. Try it again? Okay. Yeah. But uh, we've, they've said it's good. So Really? Yeah. So what's wrong with me then? Well, that's bizarre. I don't what know. My computer's at, on over my here? personal computer is acting up, so maybe it's not just you, but yeah, we're we're good from all okay. counts. So let me explain something to you guys. Um, the morning weigh-ins are typically eight to ten in the morning. The afternoon weigh-ins are at four. So between eight and ten in the morning on the morning weigh-ins, a Nevada State Athletic Commission. We're just going to use the state as the example. You have those two hours in which you can walk out and go, I'm ready to weigh in. And the commission official, as long as there's someone not currently on the scale, I think pretty much will say, right this way, sir. The media has already understood that they should be ready to go at any time to take their pictures and to document or record, whatever, uh, as well as the UFC staff. So the fighters will come out if they have to, wait 30 seconds or a minute, but then they'll, they'll pretty much get on that scale, weigh in, and then they have a table full of rehydration goodies, uh, some fruits, some fluids. And so it's a quick process, right? And again, that can be anywhere between 8 and 10. The weigh-ins as we know them that ended two years ago, the afternoon weigh-ins, was this is how it really worked, guys. You stepped on the scale at 4 p.m. local time. At that particular moment is when we knew if we had a title fight or if somebody wasn't going to make weight. And then... If they didn't, they had additional time there, anywhere from an hour to two. And I guess if the commission felt like, hey, man, this dude's or gal isn't looking good, that's when a doctor may shadow you and watch you and just make sure that you're, they don't have to shut down your, your weigh-in. And at that point, you would declare that you're heavy. However, what a lot of people don't know is at 1 p.m. is when you would report to the lobby so that you could bus over or go in a van or walk over, depending on where you're at, to the weigh-ins. 1 p.m. At 1 p.m., you would go over to the weigh-ins. And even if you want to go old school, that's when you would kind of bring your last-minute tweaks to your banners and your shorts, and they would look you over there. So you sat miserable and dehydrated from 1 p.m. to 4 p.m. Mm -hmm. You weighed in at 4 but really, you had to be on weight at 1 p.m. Now, what a lot of fighters, I believe, did was they would be in sweats and glasses and headphones at 1 p.m., maybe anywhere from a pound to a half pound to a quarter of a pound over, knowing that they could float that last pound, half a pound or quarter of a pound during the bus ride, during the weight, during the process of getting to 4 p.m. local time. And they would. They would actually make it because the body can do it. Slowly, though. But for the most part, you were told to come in on weight at 1 p.m. So really, what we're fighting over is three hours. 
10 a.m. being the last time you can weigh in for the morning weigh-ins, and 1 p.m. Now, we've painted a picture last week and the week prior of it being six to eight hours. It's not untrue because if someone weighed in at eight, it's the same thing as four, right? If you're the first one on the scale at four, because you know that weigh-in show takes 30 minutes? Those guys that are weighing in last, the main event, it's like 20, 25 minutes later that they walk in and weigh in and face off and say something to Joe Rogan, and then they can go and start drinking Pedialyte. So if you want to get technical, it would be eight if you're the first guy, or four if you're the first one on stage, 10 if you're the last guy, or about 4.30, you know? So let's just do the morning one. Eight to four is eight hours. That part is not untrue. If Goes got to do the morning weigh-in and I got to do the afternoon, he would have an eight-hour rehydration lead on me. But if Goes weighed in at 10 in the morning and at 4, I had to be ready at 1. I had to be on weight at 1. Technically, he only has, I guess you could say, no, I guess... I guess it's still – it's the rehydration that's important. Yeah. Right? Not the making weight. It's the rehydration that's important. Well, All you would have is six hours additional because until I step on that scale at four, they don't know that I'm sitting a pound over and I got all these hoodies on and I'm just slumped over in the in the bus. But technically, I'm hoping to sweat in this next three hours, mm -hmm. that last pound, half a pound, quarter of a pound. It's that's not going to happen that often, though, right? Yeah, that's not. I mean, that's somebody I'm pretty sure – yeah, I don't train. think they came out to the lobby. I mean, John could probably tell us, but – the couple times I've been in a lobby, I don't remember. I think they would just report and get on a bus. It's not like Bert had a scale there or anyone else had a scale at that time. You were just supposed to be on weight at that time. And if not, you had to tell Bert or I believe the new guys, Tony Barbosa or whoever it may be. Hey, man, just so you know, <coughs> yeah. this is my deal. So it's really the rehydration process. That's what the fighters are fighting for because they'll make weight whenever. But what they want is those additional eight hours. Because whether you had to be on weight at one or, or two or three or four, it's when you could take that first drink and start to consume any mm -hmm. form of nourishment. Eat your meals, all right. that stuff. So it's those eight hours what they're fighting for. As far as making the weight, what Holly Holmes says is just back up the morning weight, which would be she's saying something about 12. And what she's saying is you have until 12 to make weight. Well, it's only one hour less than the reporting time. Of being on the bus. Back on the... Right? She's right about that. But what fighters want is they don't want those three hours of sitting on the bus. They can't stand that. You see what I'm saying? They they wish they could do away with that, too. It would also give them additional rehydration time and not that misery of I'm now 135 or 145 or whatever for the next three hours. And I think they have a point. Well, at some point, somebody's going to have to pull Dana aside and say, who are these people, right? Because that's all we've heard from fighters is don't do it. What's his answer going to be? When you confront Dana like that, he'll – let's say Dan, let's say, let's say Dana White says, for, I've talked to most fighters. I've talked to fi most fighters, and they want to do the 4 p.m. And then if you come with the facts like that, I don't care how professional you are or um, confrontational or respectful or whatever. If you come with any form of fact that backs him into a corner, he's going to push you back and go back over the top. And that's why that one day he said, are we still on this? It's four, and that's it. And he shut it down. You see what I'm saying? That was the message to you and the future people mm -hmm. because you backed him into a corner. All you did was say something that's pretty logical, like, who is it? Because I follow every fighter on the roster, and not one has tweeted that. And I'm hanging out here with a lot of the top journals, and we're asking each other, do you talk to anyone? What would your guys say? And none of them are saying that. So that's what he's going to say if you ever ask him that question. He's just going to push you back even harder. That's the way, they, that's the way he's always struck. Um, and it's worked because a lot of fighters are like, oh, okay, next question. <laughs> How about Romero and Whitaker? You know what I mean? Yeah. And then he's done with it. So it has to be somebody that can get to him. So almost... I hate to go to politics, but you know how Trump was kind of sticking with the whole uh, the separation of the kids and the parents? Mm -hmm. And it was actually the Went wife that kind of made sense. The wife and the daughter who kind of, dad, you know, or honey or whatever, you're being a dick. And, and he went and signed that bill. 
somebody that has that type of relationship with Dana is going to have to say, listen, man, let's figure it out so that it doesn't hurt business, but that we still have what we did for these fighters. Because if you go back to UFC 199 and just do some sort of a Google search, what's going to come up is the topic of early morning weigh-ins. That's when I believe Bisping knocked out Rockhold. Holloway fought uh, Lamas, that card, at the Forum in L.A. Go back around that time and search all the stories, and you're going to find the early weigh-ins. And I guarantee you there's quotes there attributed to Dana White that said, uh, this will give the fighters additional rehydration time, and we're always looking out for them fighters, the, the, the health and benefit of them fighters, my guys and gals. There's going to be a quote that says that, but it was two years ago. He's hoping you don't dig it up, but it's there. Trust me. Because it was a big deal. Everybody was fired up about it. So somebody needs to point out to Dana and go, remember how we felt about this two, week, two years ago? How stoked everyone is and the big backlash is there? We got to keep that and figure out what can we can do for that 3% that's missing weight and that's costing us money because we are a business. We make, bi we, we, we make dollars and cents here. And we're losing fights. We got to figure this out. That talented kid, Mike Bond, over at MMA Junkie, he laid it all out for us. Let's let's adjust to that. And my question to Junkie Nation and goes and Dan and John when he gets here is how do we get there? I can only think of Mike Chiesa said when you get there on Tuesday, you either say I'm in for the morning weigh-ins or I'm in for the afternoon weigh-ins. I was okay with that. But I don't know that I guess the we'd UFC have to start. Gonna do it. Huh? I don't think the UFC is going to do that. Yeah. But, um, but okay. I say turn up the clock and give somebody a late night option. All right, all you that love the night so much, mm -hmm. 8 to 10 p.m. at night. Weigh in then. Then you'd have a jump on the ones that love to do it in the morning or just are okay with doing it in the morning. I guarantee you most people would even go to that one and only there would only be a few stragglers for the morning. You'd have to have a commission official there, right? Right, and I asked the commission official. I happened to run into one at a spot that I frequent. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, hey, 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 he had, to, he had to actually run out. And I go, I need you for two minutes. Huh? Let me ask you these the quick questions. The crack up until two. It wasn't at the crack dig, but it was, oh, all right. it was close to... Where the crack egg is on sunset, this took place also on sunset. Oh, okay. All right. <laughs> and I said, "Listen, man." He, he goes, "Well, I'm a I'm a ref," and I go, "I I know that, but you've also functioned as a commission official." I go, "What would it really take for a commission official to make themselves available for an additional two hour window prior to that morning way and the night before?" And he gave me a number. Goes, it was an easy number. Yeah, yeah, it was an easy number, and and on the high end, it, it's an easy number for the UFC. That's easy. for that's just for commission, right? So the UFC is going to battle. It's backwards. that guy that's got the clipboard that's standing there like this. Yeah, you know the one you see on tough, mm -hmm. and he's and he just goes, "All right, up, uh, Brad Katona," and everybody claps, and then the next guy, that guy, to stand there for two hours. Um, the UFC staff, find someone, man. If you don't want to overwork them or overtime, I, they're all running around like with the chickens. Heads cut, cut off. We always heard that, and I believe it. I've seen it. Find someone else. I'm sorry. Someone can be there to, to verify this, and the commission official, and we have ourselves an official weigh-in. The media will be there. They, they got to be there. Well, okay, that was going to be my question. So now you've bought an additional eight hours, which is in line with what many people have stated, including Mike Dolce. If we can get closer to 48 hours, even better for the rehydration of the brains, um, the bodies. And for those that go, man, I love ah, I love it at night. My body works at night. I'm nocturnal. I don't want to work, wake up and look for a 4 a.m. sauna or, or anything like that. that. That's not the way I roll, dog. Cool. You got that night option? And for those that love the morning, you got the morning option. Um, the ones in the morning will be like, shit, now that guy's got a 12-hour jump on me. His 8 to 10 is 12 hours ahead of my 8 to 10. I'm going to adapt to the night. I bet you they'll do that. Most will become that night one. Well, we could still have the ceremonial. Nobody's saying stop the ceremonial because that's a chance to do the. You know, I don't even think they should step on a scale. I should just think they should all come out, pose, face off, 
and walk out. I mean, but if they want to step on the scale, all right, we get it. It's only those hardcores that know, hey, they already weighed in. Don't, don't even do the that. The rest are actually hanging on, on their heels going, did he make it? Do we have a title fight? Oh, we do? All right, great. No, don't even do that. Here's what you do. Have them come out. Have them do the stare down. Or actually, have them sit down. Just have a desk. Two chairs. Whoever you want. John Anik, Joe Rogan, whatever. They announce the matchup. Ask one question. You know, what's going to happen tomorrow night? Blah, blah, blah. What Counter the other side. Just one question each. Have them say something. Have them square off. Done. Don't even have them step on the stupid scale. That's what I think. Yeah, because Joe Rogan could just announce their weights, honestly. Mm -hmm. And who knows? Maybe you're selling extra paper. Who knows what's going to happen in that talk, right? But I would reserve that for maybe the main card or select fighters of the prelims. I don't know that I want to talk to Jan Lee and some Russian guy that don't know English and go, what's going down? I mean, he's got to say whatever he's got to say in right. Russian, and then some guy in Russian has got to repeat it. Main card, then. Yeah, maybe main card. or, But they, I think they could come up with something creative. And if not, just a face-off, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And then, boom, you're on your way out. All right. But what is going to be the pushback from the UFC? I imagine they're going to say, I already heard Dana say it. We can't be there all night. We can't have there our staff there all night. Uh, we got to pay extra maybe for whatever room we're, we're using this, whatever it is, right? But whatever that cost is, wouldn't you agree that weight cutting is the biggest issue in MMA right now? So... If you're going to spend extra money, wouldn't it be well spent on I think this easy, subject? Easily well spent. And you don't, and the fighters would be stoked to get even more time. Yeah. And that number is not that much. I'll tell you this much. It's more than 100, and it's less than 500, and it's closer to the first number. There you have it. Most easy. cities. You know what? Fighters would pay for that. It's not like the... Um, I always joke around and say, well, get that commission official a room, you know, because they're going to be there all night and wake up in the morning. But it could either be a different commission official or it could just be an overtime pay or, or something. But you could get someone there. That's mm -hmm. not that hard to do. I, I don't know what the struggles would be with a small state if, if the commission officials are driving two hours somewhere maybe. But for the most part, you could, yeah, get them a room. I mean, the UFC has – when they go on the road – they actually, I'd, I'd love to hear the number one day. They book like 200 rooms. Like, okay, we got 12 versus 12. That's 24. And I think they get two rooms, not just one. So that's 48. And then whatever their traveling circus is, the um, cameraman, the announcers, the guest fighters. So I think the UFC's just got something like, hey, give us 200 rooms or 150 rooms. And they already call in advance and go, you guys got saunas? You guys got treadmills? You got this? You got that? All right, cool. All the check marks are hit. And they usually stay within the Marriott family. All right. Um, so an extra room for that official would not be a problem, trust me. My question is this. Is this a solution or is this just something that points us in the right direction? Because I don't think there's a solution. I just think no matter what, fighters will find a way to cheat systems. They're going to push the limits. But we need to get as close Fighters as we miss. can. Yeah. Fighters so will that still when miss. something bad happens, we say, guys, this is kind of on you. But at we least did everything we could. But at least to according to Mike Bond's we data, we'll at least chop it in half. Because it's not going to go away. People and that's a victory. Away. That's a victory. A big victory. Exactly. We're chopping it in half. The fighters get into rehydrate even more time. That's yet another victory. Um, the only negative is payment to a commission official and maybe supplying them with a room but i don't see that being a problem and venue, UFC. but yeah it's these are all this is peanuts compared to what this could actually cause right so as much as i like holly holmes idea hey you get till 12 which is only one hour less than the ones that were supposed to make it at one if they can start the rehydration process all right cool but um Dana White's idea of 4 p.m. is just less rehydration time and more, and it's three hours of the, the state of being dehydrated at that weight. That That's just, that's too long. Man, but that is the way it works behind the scenes. Let's take a break. You're listening to MMA Junkie Radio on Sirius XM Rush 93. Stay close. We'll be right back. If you want to call in, it's 866-522-2846.
to link into the MMA Junkie Radio Doesn't Network. Work. Hit us up on Twitter.com at MMA Junkie Radio. This is MMA Junkie Radio. Here are your hosts, Gorgeous George and Goes. All right, we're back. Listening to MMA Junkie Radio on Sirius XM, March 93. This one, right? Mm-hmm. So we're trying to figure out weight cutting. Uh, I, I, it would suck if next Friday and, sorry, Thursday and Friday, the fighters fighting at the tough finale and the UFC 226 card would be subjected to the 4 p.m. weigh-in. I don't think it's progress. And I think even though the UFC is saying, actually the one thing UFC is not saying is that it's more of a business decision. And if they did, I think more people would at least respect their point. Because they're not wrong. If 63 fights have fallen out since the morning weigh-ins have been enacted, and 32 prior to that, the two years prior to that, then one could say, oh, it, this isn't working. I mean, I, they, wouldn't be, they wouldn't be wrong. And it does affect business. Yoel Romero was .2 away from making that a title fight. Would he have gone home with the title? No. Did it affect his mind, his psyche going into the fights the following day? Maybe, but, I mean, he looked like a pretty competent fighter out there. But the numbers don't lie. We have lost uh, almost, yeah, twice as much. How can that be fixed while also preserving the gains that were made two years ago when they said, we're weighing them in in the morning, more rehydration, blah, blah, blah. That's what we're trying to figure out. I still haven't heard a good solution at least one that works for both sides. Most of the times you'll hear the fighters present what they think. And the one that's fucking annoying is same day weigh-ins. That shit ain't going to work. Never. Because, again, they're always going to cut to when they're told they can cut. But can you imagine just having hours to decide what the fuck you're going to do? And having to cancel fights then? I mean, that as horrific it is, as it is the night before, there have been some miracles that have taken place some reshuffling of the uh, the card and you can do that with hours in advance but come on give them at least the night to strategize with their you know uh when habib found out he had to fight iaquinta and not holloway i mean at least he had the night to sit with his coaches and go all right so what's he like to do yeah all right so okay you want underhooks here or you want okay you know something man but you can't do that on the same day that's just, I don't know. It's unprofessional on on everyone's side, mostly on the promotion side. Now think about if you give them the the uh, the eight hours in advance. Now you're almost giving them the promotion has 48 hours to work with any debacles that might pop up. If I'm not mistaken, when John Jones was pulled out of UFC 200 in 48 hours, they were able to sub in and get Anderson Silva in there. Mm-hmm. Was it the greatest fight ever? No. We got ourselves a fight, but it wasn't really that great of a fight. But it was a fight, you know. And you could be a fan that bought the bought a ticket and said, "Well, at least I've never seen Anderson Silva fight live." Right. So that's good. Right. And but they can you imagine showing up to the arena and just the fight that you paid money for is gone? You know how much? There's no way same day weigh-ins will ever happen. Same day weigh-ins is, is is not a good idea. And then why would you want to even limit more the rehydration? What they say is with well, a lot of fighters that suggest that our media is well fighters would come in closer to weight therefore they wouldn't be cutting as much but i i don't buy that one man i think guys are still gonna push the limits and that's just the culture of mixed martial arts which is very close to the culture of of wrestling but you know they say they've fixed it with wrestling and now guys are wrestling more at their weight i get it but not to take away anything from wrestling and I'm mostly talking to the collegiate level programs here. That's that's not big business in terms of dollars and cents. I mean, it, who doesn't want to be a Big Ten champion or a Big 12 champion or a NCAA two-way All-American, runner-up, champ, whatever. That is big business. But in terms of dollars and cents is what I'm talking about. Um, it's a little bit different here in our sport. Now... Will all the promotions follow suit? I don't know. And one's kind of doing their own thing. Who's the one that has them weigh in 
has their main event weigh in first and then works their way down. Strike Force back in the day. Strike Force would have the main event weigh in and then go backwards. But Strike Force wasn't organized well. Much respect to the organization and the small team that they had, our guy Mike Afromowitz, Scott Coker, and a few others. They didn't have a big team. They didn't have resources. And so at least on the cards that I went to, especially the one at the Playboy Mansion, we got to see a lot of that up front. And people were standing around, and they were pissed. But it was the main event guys that stepped on the skill first, and then they went backwards. But they were actually still filling out, uh, li getting their licenses, turning in blood work. It was a mess. That's If you want a quick story here, that's when goes, and I said, oh, really? You're Peruvian? To George Masvidal? Oh, hey, how'd you like 200 bucks? And you walk in with our banner. Was it a banner? Yeah. Yeah. He goes, okay. That's how sponsorship worked back then. We didn't know what the fuck we were doing. We were tag radio. And we're at the Playboy Mansion the next day, and we're sitting there watching, waiting for them to come down the aisle. And here comes <laughs> George Masvidal with nothing that resembles tag radio. And we're like, well, that sucked. We just gave away 200 bucks. Saw him later on. I forgot. Or they misplaced it. Or what did he say? They lost it in the room, I think. Something like that, yeah. We had just met for the first time that night. So we, we couldn't really go, bitch. You know, we just kind of went. Oh, man, that sucks. I mean, we were newbies, man, as noob as you could get. That uh, that Strike Force show was in October of 2007. Our show started in April. We had six months under our belt. We didn't know what the fuck we were doing. So, uh, yeah, that's how, that, that's how Strike Force even worked back in the day. We still hold that little 200 bucks <laughs> over George Masvidal. <laughs> we want to cash in. When we tried. We tried. I've cashed in like three times. Have you? Yeah. Yeah. We tried one of the last shows before. Let me get this straight. Before they went to Reebok only, and I think it was actually either UFC 200 that week or a little bit before that. That was just a small fight night show. And it was one of the last shows when you were going to be able to come in with a banner, you know, stuff on your shorts and, and your shirt and everything. It was the season of the Black Zillions versus American Top. Oh, yeah. However long ago that, that was. One or two shows before Masvidal was on it. And we said, bro, I bought some love. You know, put us on that banner. And he goes, I got you. So we sent him the logo. Was he going to wear a t-shirt or the logo? What was it? He was going to wear a t-shirt, I believe. Yeah. Ah. And the UFC, remember I told you about the 1 o'clock weigh-ins, how you're supposed to report to the lobby? They would actually be checking shit. Yeah, you're good. You know, banners and all that. And they caught that, and they go, you can't have another outlet. And we had gotten permission from Dan, because Dan's by the book. Right. All right, by the book. And he said, look, it was a deal from 10 years ago. Um, if it goes through, it goes through. Plus, we had established ourselves. Right. I think anybody that saw that wouldn't go, oh, man, these guys are subjective. <laughs> miles at all. But the rest of the UFC, they call it like it is, right down the line. I, I think everyone knew. This just probably would have been something that slipped through the cracks. Maybe uh -huh. Dan could even blame it on those zany guys. <laughs> so we we tried it, and um, they caught it. And so George goes, man, they won't let me do it. And so we weren't able to sneak in MMA Junkie Radio. Or, t or were we giving them tag? I forget. No, the second time we gave them so MMA yeah. Junkie Radio. Uh, so we tried, guys. We tried. Um, uh, it, it was never ha it, it able to happen. And we've never pushed a fighter to say something, wear something, do nothing. We've only gotten a couple surprises. One was Frank Trigg wearing goes jitsu at Pride. Um, and that's about it. I don't think every, everyone else has given us any form of a shout-out. We've just never gone out and asked for it or whatever that I can remember. But, eh. We're in the tag radio, so uh, having a little bit of nostalgia there. It's an awesome shirt. Oh, thank you. Um... Let me get one of these in here. Here are your favorite sports okay. from a different perspective on the Vegas Stats and Information Network. v gives you the view from the counter on the only channel broadcasting live from a Las Vegas sportsbook. Follow the money while you follow the games on Series 6 m Channel 204. Odds are you'll like what you hear on the Vegas Stats and Information Network. Did you talk to John? Is he coming in? I was just asking him that question. So he had sent a message that says he's still at the Palms, unfortunately. Is there uh, one on wait? I can ask him. Uh oh. Did I jinx them? When I said everyone's made wait about these it, yeah. last ten. <laughs> I'm doing the math now. Maybe that's what's going on. Huh? These last ten shows, everyone's been great. Yeah, who knows? Um, <laughs> all right, out in Singapore, Donald Cerrone lost to Leon Edwards. 
he lost my uh, decision. And first of all, what did you guys think of the fight? Quick reaction. I thought it was a fun fight. It was deceiving a little bit, though. Like, the way you, you could almost make a case for each guy in a lot of the rounds. So it was kind of weird to score, but I thought the right guy had his hand raised at the end of the night. It was fun. I'll, I'll say this. I thought Leon Edwards kind of looked like what Donald Cerrone used to look like. That's uh, no disrespect to Donald. Donald fought his ass off, but... Uh, With the flu, apparently. Yeah. Or he said sick as a dog. and I imagine Even that day. Yeah, he almost pulled out. But he didn't, and he went out there and, and did his thing and came up short against Leon Edwards. What we found out was that he was drawing dead on two fight on two scorecards already. Um, the announcers thought it was 2-2. Two -two. I had a feeling 2-2 two -two was... That could work for me, but... Man, this was an early morning card. Between that and the World Cup, I'm sometimes running on fumes. So mm -hmm. I was just like, okay. And so I thought it was very winnable for Donald at the end. But then when I looked at the judges' scorecards, Leon had already wrapped it up on two of them, even going into that one. So it, even going into the fifth. I could, you could have sold me on 2-2 two -two going into the fifth. Yeah, it was the third round, I believe, that had two judges scoring it for Edwards, which solidified their cards, and one calling it for Cerrone. But... uh I you know, no, I, nobody really seemed to object, and now Leon Edwards wants Masvidal, and our own Stephen Morocco caught up with Masvidal, and he said, "Sign me up, I'm in." How about you guys? Seems like a fun fight. Except, well, Masvidal's a name, so when you're a name, you can kind of call a little bit of shots. But if the UFC uses the blueprint of guys coming off wins versus guys coming off wins, losers, guys coming off loss versus guys coming off loss, then that may not work. But eh, lately, I think they've kind of gotten away from that. If stuff works, they just throw it to the wall and stick it. Did you like the fight, the main event? Um, yeah, yeah, I, I like the main event. Uh, sorry, I was just thinking about the Masvidal thing now. Um, I, I, I don't like that Masvidal fight, but I'll work my way to that, I guess. Uh, I just I just thought the main event, yeah, like you guys you guys said, um, you know, three rounds to two is how I had it. Uh, maybe it was because of the commentary. Maybe because it was because of uh, the production going into Cerrone's corner. Um, and, of course, you know, there were arguments for Cerrone, but maybe it was because they were going into Cerrone's corner, the production commentary, saying, hey, you won that round. Oh, you stole that round, when he might not have. Maybe got it into my head because when I saw Leon Edwards not really putting much out in the fifth round, I was like, dude, he might have gave this fight away. And especially what we saw with Thompson and Till, you know, uh, a five-round uh, just, just, just a couple weeks earlier. And in close fights, for whatever reason, though it's round by round, it's not supposed to be scored that way. It feels like that last round almost depends on... You know, uh, the last round almost decides the fight. So, yeah, I, I mean, so I wasn't that surprised. I had it 48-47 Edwards. I don't like the Masvidal fight, though, because I, I like it stylistically. I think it's I, I like both guys. I think they'll match up great. I think I, I want, Mas, as a fan of Masvidal, I want him to have high-profile fights. I think a high-profile fight motivates him and gives us a good Masvidal, which is great. But I don't like this trend of, like, let's throw Jorge Masvidal. He's a top guy. He's, again, all the accolades and stuff we just poured on Jorge Masvidal. It, I, I don't like it. I don't think it's right. I think it's opposite what they're doing at lightweight. At lightweight, he was going against all these killers. He was getting, not robbed, but there, mo uh, there's a case for almost every split decision to have gone his way. Yet he was never getting that respect. He was always the criminally underrated guy. So what does he do? He goes up to welterweight, and I love Jorge Masvidal, but loses most of his fights. And well, he's a top guy, and he, he's always the, the first guy we're throwing at the top of the list. And not that I am against that, because I'm a big Jorge Masvidal fan, but as a fan... It's like it's like the same thing with like uh, Joe Lozon or Jim L Miller. You love those guys, but you're like, they get one win. You know, they get the armbar for Mauricio Camoys or Joe Lozon gets some you know crazy submission win, and then they're right in there with a Pettis, right in there with a Killer, right in there with a Gallard when he Gallard was on top or whatever. And you know they beat those guys. You know, but uh, sometimes they didn't. Sometimes they did. But it was like, oh, it was ruthless. I want to I want to see this guy get some momentum. He's good. He's a fan favorite for a reason. Let's get him some momentum. Let's not just throw him aimlessly here or wash him aimlessly down Edwards? there. Edwards. Uh, Masvidal. Masvidal. So I just wanted to Masvidal right how he's been treated between lightweight to, to welterweight. I don't, I don't, you know, I, I, I don't think they found the happy medium yet. I think they've been overcompensating or they're not giving them enough. Well, man, I'm not so sure. I, just, I agree, Dan. Hold on a second here. You're saying you want a better matchup for Masvidal because he is coming off. No, Maya I, I, yeah, and, no, uh, I want a less. I want a less. I want him Thompson. to be able to. I want him to be able to b uh, build up because oh. he's he's always the name. We're like Masvidal, I know Masvidal, he Masvidal. Cowboy when he came up. Well, let me pull him up. I, I, was the other one Magny or? No, he's been wanting Magny for the longest time. Uh, yeah. Ellenberger. He didn't smash it, but he was winning, and, and then Ellenberger's foot it's got a weird stuck. Situation. Right. So and I think he got a lot of play off those wins, 
And next thing you know, he uh, he was getting those other two fights. I think he's two and two. But let me check here. He, here's the matchup I want for Jorge Masvidal. I want them to bring bring Jorge Masvidal okay. to Russia, who because I believe Jorge. I think he said he wouldn't mind fighting in Russia. If I, I think with Bodo, there, yeah. and uh, bring back Albert Tumanov and put him against Jorge Masvidal. Tell me that's not a matchup that gets you guys excited. I don't even know if you guys. It, uh, it is, not but you talked about Albert Tumanov last week. Come on. It is, but <laughs> name wise, I don't know that. Uh, I feel like Jorge's. Jumped now. And I think Edwards like pops a, name a little like bit more, more just because yeah. he's coming off the win now. Edwards a week ago, I think if you ask Masvidal, he'd be like, nah. But isn't Jorge cu cu coming off two losses or, or, or something like that? We're going to mm -hmm. put him against a guy who's one of the top winning records, active winning records. You but know what I'm saying? I think what it comes down to is how the UFC wants to promote. And if I had to guess, they probably want more out of Edwards than they do out of Masvidal. I mm -hmm. think they've the ship has sailed maybe with Masvidal as far as how they promote things. So they may be this looking at us. The ship a has sailed, in my opinion. Yeah. The way I look at it is this: I'm gonna try and be as sub uh, objective as possible, but I'll probably come off subjective. Okay. I think he came, I think he moved up to welterweight. Where was he? He moved up to welterweight versus Caesar. For, oh shit, he's been there for a while. Iaquinta was yeah. the loss that really. He won that fight. He loses to Benson and Lorenz. Lorenz was a close one, split. Yeah, he Benson was split. that was a close one too. Yeah, and he fought Pearson at welterweight. Pearson's even moved up to welterweight. Yeah, that was yeah. a weird. That was a that was a, like a one off for Pearson. And then he takes care of Ellenberger, but I think Cerrone put him into a top ten because Cerrone had won four in a row right. as a welterweight, and when he beat him, it it gave him some elevation. Right. But then he came up short, so I think. Masvidal's like, all right, look, I came up against number one and two or two and three or wherever these guys are, came up short. But it doesn't mean I'm 18 or 19 because I also beat Cerrone, who was ranked. So I think he feels like he's somewhere in the five to seven range. And that's why he feels these, uh, these yeah, names yeah, yeah. like Usman I don't or whatever. Now, right. The Usmans, the Edwards of the world, they're like, hey, man, we're like eight and one, seven and two. You know what I mean? Which is uh, a more competitive record than what, than what Jorge has. Um, but yet, Edwards called him out, so he's right. just reacting to that one. With Usman, yeah. I'm not sure. Um, with Magni, I guess there's bad blood, but um, I'm not trying to beat Captain Save a Bro. So we'll right. see. We'll see. That's what Edwards wanted. But congrats to Leon Edwards. That was a, a good win for him over Cerrone. And real quick, we have about a minute before we go to the last commercial. Is Cerrone done, guys? No. No. I no, in terms of, of being can, a title can be contender a world or something. A world champion? No. Although, you know what? Because of the way he always keeps himself in shape, mm -hmm. should someone get hurt at some point in a title fight and mm -hmm. they need someone, I could see him slipping in that way. I think he's earned that. Mm -hmm. But as far as building him, it has to be an I quit the situation, no. like a yeah. dolly, and it reshuffled everything. Something he happens like to be on the right card because, yeah, I think he's still good for fun fights, but I don't think he could be a champ. Dan? I'm still catching up with literature over the weekend, but I want to say. Uh, Ben Folks referenced something to him being in a new phase of his career, and then that's kind of how I see it too. Um, just, just kind of keeping it in those terms. He just seems like he's in a new phase of his career where he's not, you know, picking up a check to demonize it or anything, but he's, he's having fun. He's doing what he wants to do, and he's not, he's not worrying about the title or kinda anything. Kind of like Mark Hunt at heavyweight, Shogun at light heavyweight, right? Where they're like, yeah, man, we were great at one time. We still command a name, throw us out but there, ship us to Singapore, yeah. or, or put us on a fight pass, you know. I just want to get paid. This is when the big paychecks come in. And yeah. If he did get the shot, though, would it be that outrageous to say he could win? He just beat Robbie Lawler. Robbie Lawler was a champ not that long ago. He lost to Robbie Lawler. Where, well, I mean, he but he gave him a hell of a fight. He competed, yeah. I mean, um, I, I think he could do it. All right, it well, wouldn't be shocking. Yeah. Okay. All right. We'll be right back. You're listening to MMA Junkie Radio on Sirius XM Rush 93. Stay close.
So this song, we heard it a lot in 2006 at the World Cup in Germany. Every stadium we went to, anytime there was some sort of a break or maybe the players were being let out to the field. I mean, we liked it at first. It was catchy, but boy, we got sick of it, didn't we, guys? Well, it was one of the themes, right, of the World it Cup. Was. Um, I thought it was one of the good ones, but yeah, they it, at a club, we went to a club every like six songs, I think we determined it yeah. would come back on. And then here at the in Russia, the fighters have been walking out to dun, 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 dun. Have you noticed that? No. Every team that's being let out down the tunnel with the little kids being held by the hand and the referees and all that, as they walk out, it's always dun, 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 dun. So that must be their theme. But this was the theme in, um, in Germany. So it brings back memories. Uh, that's goes? That's fat goes. Okay. Super fat goes. Gotcha. I was probably about 216 around there. Why were you guys taking a picture with Peter, with, with uh, Roger Federer, the tennis <laughs> pro? Oh, that's P from Austria. All right. Um, we got a few minutes here. We're up against the clock. We're farting around, just wasting time. John Morgan's going to join us in the second hour. Uh, Morocco and not Steven, the country, they will be facing off against Spain. Spain's a big favorite. They're playing the national anthems right now. And then you got Portugal versus Iran. Look for both of those teams, Portugal and Spain, to just win and move on. Uh, Portugal is the country that features the greatest player to ever play the game of soccer, Ronaldo, Cristiano Ronaldo. Spain at one point had a run of winning two European championships and a World Cup. It was like 2008, 2010, Cup, 2012, man. They were beasts. Yeah, they had never won a World Cup, but a uh, very, very talented team. In the second hour, we'll be talking to Ben Folks. He writes for our site, and uh, he's had some really, really good pieces. But it's always just great to get his perspective. Uh, he's our columnist on our site, and he usually just puts things in perspective, looking at both sides of controversial subjects. So stay close. We'll be right back. It's the MMA Junkie Radio Show on Series 67 March 93. And if you'd like to join in and call, it's 866-522-2846. <laughs>
He's making me forget about Roxanne. <laughs> you knew I had to come back with this, right? Second hour of the MMA Junkie Show. 6,419 were in attendance at Singapore Indoor Stadium in Kalang, Singapore for the Ultimate Fighting Championships presentation of UFC Fight Night 132 with Leon Edwards and Cowboy Cerrone in the main event. Leon Edwards got that win. He now moves on to uh, bigger fights in the welterweight division. Ovin St. Prue defeated Tyson Pedro. It wasn't going good early on. Pedro hurt him. Hell no, it wasn't going well. And St. Pierre, St. Prue, sorry, <laughs> stuck with it. Got the win in uh, about half of, our, half of a round. He he wound up getting a, an arm bar over Tyson Pedro. Pretty brutal too, man. Oh, Vince St. Prue's not lying when he says, if we hit the ground and I'm on top, you are in a world of hurt. Mm -hmm. Jessica I defeated Jessica Rose Clark. Unanimous decision there. 130-27, 229-28. Lee Jingling defeated Diachi Abe. I'm sure it's Daichi Abe or something like that. 30 27, two time. 30 26, one time. Uh, these are welterweights. Also getting wins on this card that slowly but surely is losing me. But Petter Yan got a win. Song Yadong got a win. Shane Young got a win. Song Kernan. No, Kennan got a win. Jake Matthews. I like that guy. He got a win. Jan Jeanin got a win. Matt Schnell, a.k.a. Danger from MTV, he got a win. Uka Sasaki got a win. Ji Yong Kim got a win. Dan Tom, you had a lot of wins, I noticed. You lost the Schnell fight, mm -hmm. but it was close. It was a split. And I think you got Clark I wrong, right? Yep. And that was it. I think so, yeah. Good I, job, man. Thanks, man. I, I felt bad getting that uh, Schnell one because I wanted to pick him, but I don't know if it was a... Uh, you know, the bias uh, that him having him on the show, or maybe because he looks like John John Rico. I was like, let me let me let me turn the steering wheel the other way. It was the wrong way, but I'm really happy for Chanel because um, that was a hard fought win for him. And uh, also, shouts to Shane Young. That was a fun fight with Rolando D. Shane Young's a guy. He he stepped in short notice to face uh, Volkanovski. He was a, a beast at uh, featherweight, and uh, he wasn't getting a lot of love. But watching his, his his style in the regional scene, I really like him. He reminds me just like almost like a. Uh, a more active and aggressive Mark Hominick, you know, mm -hmm. those aggressive strikers, but can kind of, kind of, kind of do it all. And uh, Shane Young had had a real fun performance, got a fight of the night for his troubles. Speaking of Shane Young versus Rolando Die, they got they shared the fight of the night, mm -hmm. fifty thousand each. Somebody score, Ronaldo? No, oh, I don't I was think so. Say. I, think Fuck. He I think he scored every goal for him in the World Cup. Let's see the replay here. Go ahead. Ooh, that was a nice pass, and he, uh, nice strike. All right. The performance of the Knights were Ovin St. Prue and Song Yadong. 50000 each for Young, Dai, OSP, and Yadong. Yadong had a really good showing. Apparently he did, yeah. He was rewarded Wait. with $50,000. He came out hard. <laughs> he earned it, that's for sure. Anymore? <laughs> no? <Okay. laughs> I'm getting myself in trouble if I go 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 down to the Yadong train. Yeah. So uh, now we all move on, and the next fight card is the finale, excluding the the Dana White Contender Series and UFC 226. Uh, what do you guys think, man? You know, like you guys still get excited. I mean, this was a wake up early card. This was a card where Edwards and Cerrone could have been on the tough finale. Um, I don't think we could have put them on Chicago because Chicago was deep. But we could have put them on tough finale. We could have put them on UFC 226. But they're out trying to conquer the world, so they got to use these names. Tyson Pedro versus OSP would have been nice on the tough finale as well. As well, excuse me. Um, but they got to do what they got to do. But th that's what global expansion does. Is it does water down some of the other cards, the ones that we do pay for. And yep. did a lot of people wake up to see this? I don't know. I did. I, I really did. I woke up. My body clock stone off with the World Cup. So I was up early to watch. I think it was England that was playing that morning. Okay. 
And uh, I caught some of these fights, but I didn't catch them all. And frankly, I'm not sad that I missed some. Mm -hmm. I made my bets early, and that was that. I got three fights in and fell asleep. Yeah, That's me, too. I think I had two and a half or three fights, and I fell asleep, and I had to catch up the next day. That was a first for me. I was up on the past Singapore cards and the, the Shanghai card. Like I'm, a, I'm that savage, you know, but even... Even me, a savage fan or someone who works in the space, it's t it's tough. So here's how the UFC feels about it, and I don't think I'm disparaging them at all by saying this. This is how they look at it. They don't care that you fell asleep. It's this not is meant for, for us. the audience in Singapore and anyone in Asia that can watch it on TV and become a fan. Why? Because they know you two numbskulls are gonna watch UFC 226 and yeah. pay for UFC 226. They got you. You see what I'm saying? Sure. They're trying to find other fans so they can get them, whether it's on their TV package or if they're the ones that happen to stay up uh, late or mm -hmm. wake up early um, so that they become fans. But that's that's just the way the UFC works. So yeah. I'm not holding it against them, and what they're saying is pretty much true. But every time I look at a fight night card and it's close to a pay-per-view, I'm like, oh, if you could have just done these on the, on the pay-per-view, you know, and that would have been that. Hey, you know why I say that? Because 64,019 showed up, right? You think they showed up because Cerrone was the main event? No. No? They mm -hmm. just showed up because it's the UFC, UFC, right? Yeah. yeah. So why not just take those guys off? Take off Pedro and St. Pru. Hell, even I and Clark. I don't know. Or leave them on. Just give them something. Maybe it's not 64-19 to show up. Maybe it's just 44-19 that show up. Someone's still going to show up. It's still going to be on TV. Well, I think the fight and pass, the they do care a little bit about it. I mean, they can't just throw it away either. Right. Yeah. It's that time for us, but it doesn't mean it's that time for the rest of the world. Yeah, I know well, the I UK people like were happy. I feel like when I see 150,000 pay-per-views or 250,000 pay like when I see that the pay-per-view business is not doing well for the UFC, I just look at how can what can they do to make it better? Deeper cards is what I'm thinking. Those cards need to stand out from the other ones. And if they're if they're still going to have um if if they're still going to, you know, saturate the sport, then the other cards just have to stick out one way or another. And if you're going to make people pay 65, man, every time you go up another five bucks, you better come strong with something. You can't just go, we're the UFC. But did you forget? We're the UFC. Have, has anyone told you lately? We're the UFC. You, you just can't do that. So you, you have to stack the cards. They kind of have gotten away with that. That's, that's no, the they thing. Have because they're not poor. They're, they're still poor. making tons of money. That, that's, that's the big thing. Is but like pay-per-view has always been things? a monster for them. And outside of take out Brock, Connor, and Ronda in the last five years, mm -hmm. take them out. Their big cards are Jones versus Cormier, GSP and Bisping, and I think Stipe and Ngannou got four hundred fifty thousand. Like anything over five hundred thousand and under a million, there's only been like four or five cards. And one of them, GSP, came back like, hey, remember me after four years? The other two was a heated rivalry. Um, Stipe's a heavyweight, and he's defending. And, you know, I mean, at some point, people are like, you know, they want to see who the baddest man on the planet is. But there's really nothing special. Everything else is coming around 250, 325, mm -hmm. 175. Hell, 85,000 only bought Amanda versus Shoshenko. You know what I'm saying? And that's a pay-per-view driven business. Who luckily is doing good and got ESPN and maybe the next deal with apparel will That's be good. That's what I'm looking at. Or, is at the end of the day, it's millionaires. They're either going to make a lot of millions or middle-sized millions. But they're still happy. They're still making millions of dollars. So they're not in trouble. They're just making a few less millions. Perhaps. No, right? here's another thing. You said, but they got us. But you and I, and we've been public about this, there's been times where we've skipped the pay-per-view. Mm -hmm. They don't get us every time. And that's you and I being hardcore is like fiending. Yeah. We want these fights. Mm -hmm. We work in the industry. And there's been times where we've either gone somewhere else to a viewing party or to a buddy's party or whatever and not gotten it for our own purposes. We're standing up to them. Imagine the ones that are a degree bef less than us but higher than a casual. So, I don't know. All right, let's take some calls. 866-522-2846 is the number to call in. Start off with Dan in Oregon. What's up, Dan? What's happening, fellas? Hi. What's up, Dan? Dan? Are, you guys, are you guys telling me that the days of you guys being able to stay up for the old prides is over? 
Hell no. Bring back Pride. Bring back those that level fighters. I'll stay up all night. Yeah, man. I didn't see Verdum and Shogun and Rona and Sakuraba and crazy the entrances. The and, and all that. I mean, this was just fight pass. Okay, one more question. Did you guys catch the Risen last year then? Uh, I some of see it. where your trajectory is going. Some of it. I'm a snob. I only catch a fight or two. I, when King Mo's fighting, I was watching, uh, but... I, I don't know. Dan, I think you're far too generous. So, yeah, I mean, some of these theatrical matchups, they're great and all that. But I, I can't get into Gabby Garcia crushing somebody or, or uh, you know, I, I, you know, I mean, Pride could get away with it because their meat and potatoes was some of the best of the best fighters. And then they would sprinkle in some bullshit. You know what I mean? Yeah. But uh, I, you got to come strong with me if you want to be rising or, you know, if you want to be another promotion and you expect me to wake up at 1 a.m. Man, I'm all into these cards. And uh, people were telling us online, at least uh, we're all uh, West Coasters here. This card was pretty much how every single European watches MMA if they're over in the U.K. They get out, they watch at like 1 a.m. till fucking 5 in the morning. Mm -hmm. That's just, that's crazy. I can't believe they've been doing this, this that whole time. But at least they get to stay up for the UFC. Game. You know what I mean? Say again? At least they're staying up for the UFC. Oh, I've, they're probably watching everything. I'm just, yeah, for the UFC, they got to stay up at that late in the day and whatnot. And I don't know. I just I think the, the hardcore level of the Americans, it's not quite there as it is for the UK. <laughs> Those are some crazy motherfuckers, it seems like. Perhaps I don't know, but I'd ra if I was living in Europe, I'd stay up for the UFC. I, as a North American, just rising. No, I, I, I'm, you're not going to get me. I'm just going to wake up for certain fights, or sometimes I may just miss it. I don't know, man. I, I can't do it. Well, I can do that. It is, I guess, man. As far as this card, this was already two thousand less people than what showed up the last time they went to Singapore, which was. Uh, the the great the goat you know Betch Cohera was the headline in that one. Two thousand less than this, and you you want to you want to strip off more fights off it? That's crazy talk in my mind, man. Like the, the global expansion is key right now. It sounds like you're just kind of greedy for the Vegas cards. You're like this could have been on tough. This could have been on tough. I think that's um, exactly what he is. Think of this. <laughs> Yeah, I kind of yeah, am. Admit it, don't you? I kind of am, but I'm more concerned about why did they only sell 250000 for a great Chicago card? What's happening in the sport on that front? Mm -hmm. Then sure hope they, you know, sure hope they strike gold in Singapore. I mean, I don't really give a fuck about that. And here's the other thing, Dan. I'm, I like the NFL. I don't like Arena Football League. I don't like Canadian Football League. I didn't like the Euro NFL when it was around. I don't like Australian rules football. I'm just not into that. When you tell me Ryzen or any other show, hey, wake up at 1 a.m., you're asking me to wake up for 1 a.m. for Arena Football League or for Hamburg versus London in the European NFL League. I'm not going to do it, and I know you wouldn't do it either. Dude, I'm up for all these cards. I, I do... Uh Fight pass and chill stream. I go watch all the ACBs at like 10 in the morning on a Friday. That's the best. Catching a Russian card. These things are awesome. I don't know. I right. think maybe. My well, I mean, then I took my hat. You're, you're a gangster then. I mean, maybe there's a higher level of hardcore fandom. Um, but I think most people feel like me, man. But all right. If that's what you're saying, I'm, I'm not doubting you do. That's so for sure. Something's got to give in your life, though. Like, what do you, what do you give up to do that? Mm, the outdoors and whatnot. That's kind of important, but fucking, Dan. Yeah, I got all the time in the world, <laughs> man. I can take in my MMA right. and my other shit. It's all about your own priorities. In my I got gotcha. you. But let's talk about UFC, the, the last pay-per-views and everything. I brought this up, man. Look at the, the ticket sales for UFC 226. They don't even have the whole T-Mobile arena open. I think there's a huge problem with outpricing people instead of going for a sellout. They, the, the tiers are all shut down. Go to Calgary. It's all shut down. And, like, the cheapest ticket is $120. What happened to the days of, like, you can go in the nosebleeds for 40 50 bucks, man? Like, 
I see every time I see an empty seat in the stadium, I picture I don't know, like a drug dealer looking at a, a crackhead that he missed out on. There, there could have been someone who got hooked on MMA in that seat, and they could have been hooked forever. But they priced everyone out. Cheapest seat is 120 bucks instead of fucking 40 or 50. I I don't get why the UFC is doing this and. Take into account, what if you loved Cowboy Cerrone? That Cowboy fight, and it just turns out, you know, four weeks of contender cost you $10 for this month on Fight Pass. And then you can cancel right after that. Opposed to a pay-per-view that's 65 bucks, man. I could see, and I, I don't know if the rumors are true, but is it better to have 150,000 people watch you on pay-per-view or the potential of the 400,000 or 500 that they say are subscribed to Fight Pass? Like, I... I don't know the answer to that, to be honest. All right. Thanks, buddy. Thanks for the call. I want to welcome John Morgan to the panel. What's going on? Not much in you. I'm good, man. Sorry, I was running a little late. We uh, put together a little video and photo gallery for the first time at the Contender Series, so I think we'll probably try to do that every week since we're there shooting it anyway. Mm-hmm. Uh, I didn't jinx anybody by saying, so far, no one's missed weight, <laughs> did I? No one did miss weight, yeah. So okay. it's, it's uh, 11, 11 shows, and nobody's ever missed weight. Again, 10, 10 Ten more morning weigh-ins, and... Were any of them stripping down going, man, this is bullshit. Bring back the night weigh-ins. <laughs> no, no, not a single person. Not the one that we talked to. Uh, but now it's uh, it's weird, too, because there were four late replacements, too. There were four people that got replaced in that card within the span of a week. So uh, all, they all they all made weight. What do you think when the story started coming out, the UFC 225 sold 250,000 pay-per-views? That, was, that had to be a little shocking. It right? was disappointing. I, I was. I mean, it's always weird because... Like, to me, and uh, kind of like we were talking about the PFL the other day, like, I don't really care what the business is. You know what I mean? Like, I, I, it's, I care more about the sport than what the numbers in, are behind, this, you know, the dollars and cents. But uh, it was shocking to see that that, that maybe only did 250000 Because all we're saying is stack the cards, right? If you want 225 or, sorry, 65 out of a stack them cards, stack that bad boy. Chicago was deep. It was almost like two stacked. But uh, I, I don't so I It just don't wasn't stacked with the right guys, but then the, presents the question, are the right guys on the roster? Are the right guys really just Connor and Ronda and Brock in the last I, five years? Is I, that it? Honestly, yeah. I mean, GSP, I guess, if you want to consider or Jones, him in there. Or Jones, he's part-time. GSP's part-time. I don't think Jones is a, is a huge Well, him and DC driver. did 800,000 yeah. in Anaheim. So that's, that's not a bad that's number. That's strong. Um, well, I think that fight is a driver. I don't know that John and much else is, is going to be a driver. I mean, if it ends up being John Jones and Brock Lesnar like we think it's going to be, um, yeah, I think that I think that'll do very very well in pay per view. Say Eric Jones and OSP, not so much. Exactly. Hmm. But yeah, I was surprised to see it. I really was. I thought that card was good, and I guess it just goes to show you, like you said, there's only those handful of real you know pay per view superstars, and and uh, it's it's got to be them to get those big numbers. But that's us. We're surprised. What I want to know is what is the company thinking when they see that? Do they see that and go, oh man, that kind of sucks? But ESPN, woohoo! Like, what is it that they're thinking? Well, they'll always give we, you a positive spin. We rarely spin. get to the end of the year where we go, man, those guys, they're, they're uh, sleeping in boxes. They'll always give you a positive they're spin. They're making money. But, but when you do a 1.65 on Nate and and Connor, even though you're not promoting Nate and Connor going forward, you mm-hmm. still want anything that gets close to that yeah. within the realm of reality. The you bar know? is set. Right. You don't expect from there to UFC 225 to be that big of a drop off. Well, and that's the question is figuring out. What do we do here? And I know people say build stars, but it's not. I'm not saying they're wrong, but that's more difficult than they say. You yeah. know, it's. You get, it's well. Look, I, I think what you're saying is the reason that we're going to see uh, Connor and, and Habib before the end of the year. You know, I think gut tells me, and, and you know, a little bit of an educated guess, but more of just a gut feeling that you know, probably just going to get uh, probation when he goes before the judge. And then I think at that point, the UFC just goes time sir. Hey. Hey, you know, he, he went through the legal system, man. The legal system said probation. Who are we to do anything more? Uh, all right, we'll see, we'll see you guys in, in October, and then that'll, I mean, that'll save the year. You think when Connor sees those numbers, he's just kind of going like this? Yes, right he is. Oh, Excellent. Can't wait to sit down at that table and start talking about this fight. You guys look like you could use a pay-per-view sale or two mm-hmm. this year, huh? I wonder if anybody knows how to do that. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I had a question for you, and I just blanked out on it. And that's when he kind of scratches here, right? He goes, oh, what is this? Oh, Nate Diaz up my sleeve. I forgot about this. <laughs> um, that dude's in such a good position. Yep. Keep talking. Keep talking, guys. Something will hit me. I had a question well, on this topic. Uh, Connor, Habib, 
Oh man, I spaced Tony it. Ferguson. Paper I don't views. know. I don't know. I don't know what Paper it is. Bus Bus and Jones. I, I, think, I think one thing I was going to say earlier was could the UFC go back to mm, favorable matchmaking, which is what Connor was accused of. You, we can't control the matchup, you know. Um, mm -hmm. But can we just did they stop protect? Doing it? Yeah, protect is a <laughs> is a word. Protect. The, you know how boxing the guys show up and they're like twenty eight and zero, and you're like, mm -hmm. I, I only heard of you when you were twenty three and zero. I mean, I think you could do you that know? on the way up, but once you're at the top, right? I mean, there's only so much creative matchmaking you can do. You gotta you gotta load out the contenders. So I mean, Connor's in that unique position because you know he's he's made himself more important than any championship belt, you know, and. Uh, He's, he's leveraged himself into a, an incredible position. Colby and Woodley, what does that pay? What does that sell? Just throw out a number. You know, if they would have uh, set it up for tough, I think it would, I would, it would do even more. Because just seeing whatever that is, 10 weeks of them just going back and forth. Man, that's what kind of got me on, on the rematch of, of Misha and Ronda. Yep. I mean, they got me a lot of times with that. So I would say if you put the right people underneath them, I don't see why you can't get somewhere in the four and fives. I think. That's what I'm thinking, man. I That's think it could I be a big one for until this pa until the you yeah. know two twenty five numbers came out. But this one would have more heat than Romero and Whitaker. So sometimes that's and what it's not sells. a rematch, huh? And it's not a rematch. It's not a rematch, yeah. Which, by the way, you're gonna be surprised when we do today's daily debate. We'll do it at some point, and I had a feeling it could go that route. Um, Old Joe Rogan was pushing for that trilogy. I think for that moment he had a brain fart and thought it was 1-1. One, one. Uh -huh. uh, he kept calling it a rubber match. A rubber match. Which is, yeah. makes it a clear 1-1. One, one. Yeah, A uh -huh. trilogy could be 2-0 right. and still but be a trilogy. A right. Um, but it was a great fight. There's no taking away from that. But does Whitaker want to sign up for that again? Hell like, no. Well, he already said. Homeboy didn't make weight, about it. and I already beat him twice. So. I beat the scariest dude in the division twice, and one of the times he didn't even make weight. I broke my hand in one fight. I broke my foot in the other. Nah, I'm good. <laughs> Did you see that fun at 205 raw though? footage, too, when he's like, oh, man, that guy hits hard. I think he's telling Dana, he goes, that guy hits hard. You know, it's like. I think if you're 2-0 against that guy, you just don't want that guy any longer. So how do we build stars, guys? Have you thought about this? Is, is, have you guys' opinion changed in any way in these last few months? I know it's a question that gets thrown around and goes. You always throw out, hey, they should have the setting like they do in boxing. But, I mean, other stuff. Because only certain fighters are going to work for that. You know, goes always brings up how Max Kellerman gets them both to – Face off, right. you know. Um, but I'd love to see that for every fight on the main card. Oh, that'd be Just cool. every pay per view, have them sit down. Cause the more you but know, no as got a that fan, much time though. But you, then people can't complain. Then that's the thing. I mean, you the UFC does things to help promote. Like it's a contender series. Yeah. They're trying to build people up. But I think there's very simple things. That I don't know that it would cost that much just to get a camera. John Anik, put him in the middle. Grab the two guys. Maybe if there isn't beef. Maybe there is now, you know, but it just seems like beefs are what sells. To me, it's all about storytelling, right? Beef yeah. is, is part of it. Just knowing more about the guys or the girls, where they came from, what their background is. Because to me, it, it, when you look at – when you ask somebody, you know, who's your favorite fighter? When they tell you, if you ask them why, then nobody's ever going to tell you, like, oh, because their boxing is so slick or whatever. It may be something, you know, but for the most part, it's like, I like their personality. I like they, you know, they came from here. They did – you know, it's normally not about techniques and skills. Even though we try to say, you know, this is a sport, it, it is entertainment too, and it's about the personalities that are involved in them as well. And uh, I, I think the UFC has got to, got to, got to get better at storytelling. You know what I mean? In, in boxing, a lot of the times people forget about who's actually fighting, and they they just look at the countries that are matched up yeah. against each other. What Mexico and the Philippines? Well, they got us last time. Like I would even try and build a little bit more on countries. Let me push you a little bit further on storytelling. Give me an example of what you would do. Just, pa I mean. Package, creating more packages, creating more like videos about people, you know, about their background, about their stories, showing their personality, whether it be sitting them down and having them speak live or whether it be, you know, going to the, the, the countdown type packages where you travel with them. I think they can do a better job of that. I think they can do more of that. It's hard because they I can was so many say damn the, events. The countdown kind of does that, and I feel like some people just aren't into it. I, well, I agree. They just watch it better. Because seeing the same thing. Yep. Five or seven minutes at a time. But that can't always be on the UFC because how many times have we seen uh, – what, what's HBO's thing called? 24-7. 24-7. Yep. You know how many 24-7s we've seen that have either featured Manny Pacquiao or Floyd Mayweather? A lot. A lot. 
But why do we keep tuning in? Because those individuals do their best in those situations to bring something new to the table where you go, oh, shit, okay, that's what Floyd does on his spare time. Oh, that's how you can only watch him train so many times. And I think that's where the UFC can maybe try a different thing when you're when you're featuring someone like a cowboy Cerrone. how many times have we been to that that ranch from the outside let's go on the inside let's see what it looks like <laughs> in there something do something different and as a fighter you should be asking for that as well by the way have i ever told you i have a landing strip here yeah y'all want to see me land a plane something do something different that's what floyd and that's what i just Manny don't know do if people time. are going to watch it if he just last but lost I his last two fights people like to gravitate towards people that are winning mm -hmm. um winning's just i you know Go ahead. But I agree with that, but it doesn't necessarily have to be like huge like countdown pre-fight style. It can be stuff that rolls through the broadcast too. Just an opportunity to I mean to have a little bit of a vested interest in somebody to 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 identify them as something and to and to latch on to something as a character as a trait. You know, I, I think you need that. Want an example? Julian Marquez was here the other day, and who was the caller that said, "Holy shit, man! I didn't know you were into comics and this and that. I like you, man. Yep. You're cool. I'm gonna root for you because he somehow attached himself." to something that's probably small in Julian Marquez's world, but now he knows about it. So and maybe every day... Fan. You never know what people are going to be drawn maybe to. Maybe every day on the UFC's Twitter, you know how they have video? It needs to be a different fighter That'd be cool. for two minutes. That'd be real cool. You know, talking about what they do from wherever they are around the world. They send each one of them a camera and says, you know, do something mm -hmm. or whatever. Send us the video, and then we'll put it up when we feel like it makes sense. That's all I can think of, man. I, 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 I uh, video quick video consumption. I know is something that a lot of the younger generation wants to do and will do, um, but you gotta you gotta reel them in. You gotta hook them in pretty quickly. Um, yeah. It's harder. I mean, to sit back and go, the UFC does. They need to do a better job of building stars. I'm, okay, yeah, you're right. That is part of their job, you know. But it's not. It's not easy. You know what I mean? It's not right. easy, especially when you can't especially when you can't control the results. Because as you said, it, people like winners. There's no doubt about it. But you don't go undefeated in the sport. You lose in the sport. It's the reality of the situation. And it's so hard to, to capitalize and to build, you know, on, on this undefeated person because they're gonna have hiccups along the so way. So can the UFC make themselves more likable and continue to sell the UFC? Therefore you're buying the UFC knowing they're bringing they're bringing the stars. The fights are going to be great because they always are, man. The fights are always great. The stars will show up, but how can we make the UFC more likable? Mm, that's tough. I'm thinking myself, and this might be a stupid example, but that would be like a movie theater saying, how can we make – I mean, you can only do so many things, right? Let's bring in some luxury chairs. Let's bring in great sound. But at the end of the day, it's about the movie you're watching, right? So I don't know that they could do – more fan stuff. I don't know, man. Yeah, it's kind of weird, you know. They're, they're kind of. I wouldn't say cutting back on fan stuff, but a, but a little bit. You know, what I mean, there's events where you don't have ceremonial weigh-ins. There's events, you know, where, where, where you don't have. You used to have a, a, a like the fan club, like the fight club, or whatever yeah. they used to call it. Uh, that doesn't really seem to uh, feature prominently in their plans anymore at all. So when I do those <coughs> that ranking stuff, I'm seeing that a few thousand showed up at Shudo Brazil. A few thousand showed up at Shudo Japan or whatever. Not everyone got comped. Right, and some people sat front row. How do we get those people's money? Hey, I'm not trying to say don't go to Shudo Brazil. Save that money for next month's pay per view, and you're gonna get the best fighters in the world. How do they do that? I, I don't. I, I mean, I think that's the thing about the. Oh, sorry. I was saying, that's the thing about the, with the global expansion. That's where it kind of cuts off. Where it's great and then all these things, but when you're kind of serving all those masters, it cuts down on it. Because I think uh, John was mentioning KSW, how they have a great insulated product. I know Alex Davis, who we've had on our podcast before, he always brings up the Japanese his, his asphyxiation with the Japanese style of MMA, and it's great because you know we, we, we like to go, oh Cerrone, what, what, what's going on? Oh, how can he just be showing up just to fight now? Why why isn't he going for championships? We always get mad at these guys for not for not doing it. Whereas Japan, they kind of celebrate their guys, yeah. but it's hard hard to kind of adapt that sensibility of matchmaking or do like what KSW is doing is because they have a in they have an insulated product, right? They, they've got a room to fill out. When you we only have one room to focus on, we can decorate this room. We can do a bunch of stuff to this room. But if you say you got to decorate and reformat all the rooms in Mandalay Bay, well, the rooms are going to be, you're getting, I'm sorry, they're going to be watered down. Yep. They're not going to have the detail that you're used to. And so as, as much as you guys are spot on with everything, I got to imagine the, the, the counter to everything that I'm seeing is just is, is where they're going. It's almost like the growth. It's great, but it's a double-edged sword. A I, got, I got one idea. We got to go to break soon. Give these – let them become individuals again. Mm. You know, like Keith Haring coming out with the duster or whatever. Um, yeah. e even Old Cowboy with yeah. his whole look. Mm -hmm. Or um, it's got upgraded look now. I, I, yeah, I don't know, man. Angela Hill was asking uh, for that. You can still Twitter fight on. You can still fight in Reebok gear, and Anakin Gooden can still tell us 
you can purchase, you know, these gears, this gear here or whatever at Reebok.com. I'm not against that. I'm sure they make a quality product, equipment. But that walkout, you have to – there's got to be something about that guy, whether he came out to clearance, Clearwater Revival, yeah. you know what I mean, or he's wearing a Liverpool shirt or a Yankee hat, and individualize them a little bit. Yeah. I'm not saying bring back the banners. You don't have to drape them down anymore or any of the other stuff that pissed off Dana White. But there's got to be something that just makes them – a character. Some of you are going to go, we don't want pro wrestling. Well, hey, pro wrestling fucking is popping right now. They're doing well. You know yeah. what I mean? And we know that they're not out there fighting for real. Like the, somebody <laughs> in the back decided who's going to win, but yet somehow these people are into it. So mm-hmm. let that marinate. We'll come back. We'll talk to Ben, folks. We'll throw it back out there, see what he thinks. And if you guys can think of uh, some other ideas, throw it out there, man, because I, I feel like we're coming to International Fight Week, and I know we're still about. 10, 11 days away, but I, I I wish we were seeing a little bit more talk and chatter about some of these great fights they got coming up. It's MMA Junkie Radio on Series 6 and March 93. Stay close. We'll be right back.
What if I wanted to break? Laugh it all off in your face. They were forged from the what same ball sack, but act as though they've never met. They are the brothers Garcia, Gorgeous George, what and Goes. If you play fantasy sports, Series 6M has a channel just for you. Listen to Fantasy Sports Radio to hear expert advice from top fantasy baseball and fantasy football analysts. Whether you need help setting your fantasy baseball lineup or you want to know who the breakout players are in fantasy football this season, the place to be is Sirius 10 xm 87 and streaming on your phone or at home on Sirius XM connected devices and speakers. All right, one of the best writers in the sport of mixed martial arts is joining us now on MMA Junkie. He writes for USA Today Sports and MMA Junkie. He's also the co-host of the Coming Event Podcast. It's Ben Folks. What's up, Ben? How you doing? Hey, you guys. I'm doing all right. How you guys doing? Good, my man. Let's get right into it here with that Whitaker Romero uh, piece that you did. Do you think that uh, Whitaker came off okay in the accusations that just stopped short, short of calling him a cheater? Yeah, I mean, I don't even know if you can call it an accusation, really, because he didn't come right out and say, like, I think this guy was doing something. Uh, you know, it just it takes the form that we're kind of used to where it sounds like somebody is saying, this guy must have been doing something special in order to get that kind of uh, recovery so quickly. But, I mean, he's not the only one to make that observation, that one day Ual Romero is being helped out of the, the weigh-ins, kind of limping along there, and then the next day uh, he shows up looking absolutely phenomenal in the fight. So, uh, I, don't, I mean, especially when you go up, when you actually watch the video of uh, the comments that he made, it doesn't seem like he's going out of his way to be salty about it or to make an accusation. And when you win the fight, you know, you don't have to come out there and make accusations. But, you know, he, he did make a point that a lot of other people observed, which is that maybe Yo Romero is just that special of a guy that at his age he can bounce back that quickly and look that awesome. Um, but yeah, it, it, it was an interesting comment from him. You know, we were just talking about right now as a panel how the UFC can create more stars. It's a question that gets asked all the time, and we always try and look for fresh ideas. And one thing that occurred to me, and, and this is what I thought of as well as I read the piece, I think a lot of fighters spend too much time speaking about others instead of themselves. Um, and I think the fighters that do talk about themselves a lot are usually the ones that in the past have become big stars. Tito Ortiz, Conor McGregor, currently Colby Covington. Chael. Chael Sonnen. Chael Sonnen. You know, they rarely bring up the others, I guess, and unless it's for a, unless it's for like a shtick or something or a certain point to bring up. Um, and, and I thought Whitaker would have came off better by saying, well, I had to do what I had to do against this great fighter. It's almost like let Yoel Romero, Romero's record and his previous wins and what got him to the dance speak for them. Use the opportunity to talk more about yourself. If, if that's what – wags your tail, you know, getting paid, making money, selling pay-per-views. But anyway, that, that's why I was asking, Ben. Well, you know, I mean, I thought that watching those comments, just the whole thing in general, and he also talks about some of his issues with USADA where he felt like uh, the kind of whereabouts failures that you're allowed uh, can act as loopholes. And I can see his point where, you know, if you, if you know that you're in a position where, hey, I just took a shot at HCH 30 minutes ago, and then, then there's a knock on the door, maybe have my girlfriend go answer the door and if it looks like a USADA inspector, tell him I'm not home. And fine, I'll take the warning. I get two a year uh, and, you know, bet that they won't catch me again, bet that I won't need to use two in, more than two in a year. He has a good point there. That, that, that is a potential loophole. And I thought he came off really uh, articulate and smart and had a lot of interesting points to make and everything. But I don't know. I mean, it's a tricky thing because I've interviewed fighters before where they'll say, like, hey, you know, I've got this fight coming up and everything. You ask them about the other guy, and they say, I don't want to talk about him. I want to talk about me. Okay, well, what do you want to say about yourself? Because that's a tricky thing, too. It's hard to get out there and be like, I'm just going to talk about myself without saying just the same things everybody else always says. You know, like, hey, I'm going to go out there. I'm not worried about what he's doing. I'm going to go out there and impose my game plan. Whatever. I mean, you, you, I think, quickly realize that while that sounds good in theory, if you if you don't have any anything interesting to say, you don't have any interesting anything interesting to say about much. It doesn't matter if you change the topic, uh, and so it's easier said than done for a lot of those guys. And I mean, guys like Chelson and Colby Covington, I think they did make a whole lot of hay out of being able to talk about other people. And that was Chelson's whole thing for a long time was he he's the guy who's going to be willing to poke Anderson Silva in the chest and say a bunch of inflammatory things about him. Um, so I think it, it all depends kind of how you do it. If you have the personality, you can pull off a lot of that stuff. Mm -hmm. Do you think Cowboy Cerrone is going to become somewhat like a Mark Hunt 
a Shogun Hua where he'll be a card filler who can maybe even carry a card because he's earned those stripes. But yet at the same time, it does appear he'll know he will not be a champion in whatever class he's fighting. It kind of seems like he's already there, doesn't it? I mean, you look at the last three fights, and it's like I made this point in my, my post-fight piece where it's just the his record, it looks like UFC fight night, cowboy versus blank, over and over again, the last three. And they're all in the kind of places where it's a different kind of a fight night. It's, you know, Gdansk, Poland, it's Singapore, uh, that kind of stuff. And he, right now, the appeal with Cowboy Cerrone is that you can book him against kind of anybody. You can give him a, a young up-and-comer. You can give him another guy who's known to be a gritty, tough guy in the division. And he'll give you a fight. You know, he might not win them all, but he's going to give you a fight every single time. And that has a real value to the UFC, but it's also not the same way that they look at somebody where they think, well, this guy's a potential contender. We're going to uh, give him a, a series of fights that might build him up to a, to a title fight. Uh, he's not there anymore. He's, he's 35. He can still go, go out there, yeah, even against tough younger fighters, and give you a good show, make it a close fight, get his licks in. But it does seem like they've kind of decided this is what a guy like Cowboy is good for right now. And for his part, he seems to be kind of okay with that, that he's just going to keep doing that until they tell him, that he can't even do that anymore. And I mean, I think you got to give him a lot of credit for as many years as he's put in and as many miles on the odometer that he can still go out there uh, against a tough young guy and still give you a good fight. Ben Folks, our guest here on MMA Junkie Radio. He writes for us on MMA Junkie, and uh, he has uh, pieces like the trading shots with Danny Downs, the Twitter mailbag, and, of course, he's got his podcast, the co-main event podcast. All right, let me turn it over to the guys. Goes, what do you have for Ben Folks? Ben, uh, USADA was brought up earlier in this interview, and you had an interesting piece there with Josh Barnett talking about his disdain for USADA, and we kind of spoke on this show a little bit about the direction of where he could go. Um, can we get your thoughts on that? I think I had pitched that I could see him more in Ryzen. I think Georgie said uh, Bellator? Bellator, right? And yeah. I don't remember what Dan said. Um, John, did, did you have a... Where do you think Josh Barnett ends up? I, I, I want to see him over in Japan. That's that's my thoughts. I mean, I, I do like the idea of the Bellator tournament, though. I mean, the, the more people kind of present that's that. What, that's what it was. That's yeah. an alternate in Bellator. That's an alternate in the tournament. But I want to see him in Japan. He can, he can pro-wrestle and he can kind of go back. To, I feel like his star is greater over there. Uh, as far as, I'm sorry? Uh, with Josh Barnett. Where, where did you end up saying that you, you, you thought he'd look good ending up at? Oh, I, I mean, I, I was with you guys as far as the, the, the Japan angle, but... Uh, I also thought, you know, it it, it depends. I, it depends on what he wants for cha championship aspirations. But I also thought Bellator would would also make for a, a decent one, depending yeah. because just because of the leverage and what they've allowed their other fighters as far as extracurricular stuff from kickboxing uh, to pro wrestling deals. That there's kind of already a precedent there. So we're split here, Ben. What what, what do you think? Well, first of all, I did not realize that John Morgan was going to be on this episode. Otherwise, I would have declined the invitation. <laughs> uh, <laughs> second of all, well, you know. I really like the idea of uh, Josh Barnett on a Bellator, in the Bellator Grand Prix because you, know, you slide him in there, you know, Josh Barnett versus anybody for an alternate spot. Yeah, I'm going to watch that. At the same time, though, when I read his statement, that sounded like a guy to me who really has his eyes on, like, the wonders of free agency and the kind of various weird things you could get into when you're not tied in one promoter. You know, Josh Barnett versus Cup of Noodles guy at Ryzen New Year's Eve. Yeah. You know, I'll watch that. <laughs> Thinking more. But as far as, like, a fan, I think there's more interesting opportunities for him over there in Bellator. I just don't know if he's willing to jump right down to, to getting tied down in somewhere else like that. Right now, as we speak, uh, there's a story on MMAJunkie.com. Bellator announces welterweight tourney with Paige, Daily Lima, Korshkep, and McDonald. As soon as I saw this, I thought of something else that you had just written. Uh, you were talking a little bit about the PFL. We've been talking about the UFC. Do you guys feel like this announcement maybe put it was a little bit of pressure being put on Bellator to come up and kind of just remind people, hey, we're still around as well? What, what do you think, Ben? Well, I think Bellator is smart to kind of focus on some of these tournaments. I mean, the, the heavyweight Grand Prix thing has gotten Bellator uh, more attention than anything else that they've done i mean it's uh, it's gotten them more attention than some of the more uh let's say out of the box thinking they've done with some of the matchups and it's gotten like the right kind of attention as opposed to like dada 5000 kimbo slice kind of attention uh and so it's smart for them to look especially when you're competing with the ufc and you're trying to find a way to slide into those niches that the ufc does not do one thing that the ufc doesn't really do is tournaments and 
So if you can put on those kind of tournaments, and you, especially in the divisions where you actually have good, exciting, known fighters. Ben? The tournaments, but you have to have alternates come in. We kind of expect that in this sport, you know? So I, I think it's a great idea on that one. All right, John, you got anything yeah, for Ben, wanna, who's not too well, big of a I fan mean, of you being ben here? snub me, I don't know if I have a question <laughs> for him anymore now that I know his true feelings about me. But, no, I, Ben, I did want to ask you. On, on anyone the, talking? I just hear blank air. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe somebody could translate this for uh, Mr. Folks. But, yeah, I did want to kind of kind of get your uh, – Get your thoughts on PFL because it was an interesting scenario where you're asking, you know, did did the PFL actually outdo the UFC this week? Kind of, kind of where you think they're stand so far, and where you where you think the chances of success are? Because I know we've been talking. I find the concept fun, like more fun than I thought I would. There's something about looking at the standings that appeals to me, and uh, the the point system, even with all the bizarre finishes, maybe it made it even more interesting. Like knowing, you know, knowing what it meant, and uh, I don't know. It seems like they got something going. And as a fan, I, 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 I'm digging it, but then I also know when they start making those $10 million payouts at the end of the year, you're like, how are the books going to look? So, I mean, how are you taking PFL so far? Yeah, you're right. I mean, that is the question is if, if you can afford to put that out. But at the same time, you know, that's how they got our attention is being like, here are the, the financial stakes, you know, and that's a, a really kind of just classic way to get people's attention in the fight game. And I don't blame them, because especially all, if you're outside the UFC and you're trying to find a way to get people's attention and to convince people, hey, you should watch these fights because they matter, not just because it's, you know, skilled, mindless violence, but because there's something at stake here that matters. And it's not enough just to be like, hey, this is a PFL title fight, because fans of MMA are going to be like, okay, so what does it mean to be a PFL champion? Yeah. You know, the, the UFC championship is kind of the thing that everybody recognizes as being the championship. But if you can say... This guy has a chance to win through this season and win through this tournament and change his life, uh, like with these uh, huge financial stakes. Everybody can understand that, and you know if you're willing to put up that kind of money, you know then that's something that you can instantly get our attention with. And it's like the same thing where we look at somebody like Conor McGregor. I mean, what makes somebody like Conor McGregor a huge superstar? In large part, it's the huge amount of money that he's making. You know, it, you'd be hard to convince us that he's a superstar if he's making 30 and 30, like regardless of what he's doing physically. If you can point to that kind of financial thing, then we're all going to sit up and take notice. And I agree with you that it, it is kind of refreshingly fun to be able to look at, like, even if it's this kind of point system where you have to spend a whole lot of time educating and re-explaining it over and over again, even your fighters don't necessarily get how the point system works. It's still kind of worth it, I think, because... It creates something for us to to look at, and where it makes a difference between if you get a finish in the first round or you go to a decision. Uh, it, it is something that lends a little more meaning to even just the kind of regular undercard bouts. Ben, are you more looking forward to Ortega versus Holloway, Lewis versus Ngannou, or Miocic versus Cormier? Oh, uh, Miocic versus Cormier. I mean, there's not a single fight you mentioned that I'm not super looking forward to. But Miocic versus Cormier, I mean, that one for me, that is the fight. Not only do you get, you know, a couple big guys thrown down at it, but, like, it's a really interesting, you know, heavyweight champion versus light heavyweight champion. If Daniel Cormier wins that, then, you know, maybe he can even skirt some of the two loss to John Jones questions in asserting his case as one of the best MMA fighters of all time. The flip side, if Stipe wins that, you know, I, then I don't see how people don't just accept that Stipe is the best heavyweight champion that the UFC has ever had. If so, yeah, that's the one for me I, I, I'm looking forward to. If Go sends you a briefcase with $100,000, would you change your Again? name legally to Dada4000? That's got, it's what it's <laughs> got to say on your passport, your license, and you got to train your two daughters to also call you that all the time. Dada4000. Why do I have to be Dada4000? I can't, I can't be Dada6000? <laughs> I can't go like a thousand more? Okay, but this now you like only get back. 75 grand, so it's either Dada4000 for oh. 100 grand or Dada6000 for See, 75 this grand. This is how you get me. You drive a hard bargain. <laughs> I'd love to see that. <laughs> I wish I was one of them eccentric billionaires. I just want to find out how much you do it for a day or yeah. a week. You know yeah. what, though? If there's one thing I've learned from having my daughters in preschool, it's that uh, any name that a child has now in the, in the current culture, any possible name you can think of, nobody will think it's weird anymore. I mean, my daughters go to school with people who have just regular names and then people whose names sound like household appliances. And it's just like, yeah, sure, fine. That's any, anybody's name. <laughs> All right, my man. Thanks for joining us here on the show. We really appreciate it. We'll catch up soon. All right. Thanks for having me. All right. See you. All right. That's Ben, folks. He did a great job out there for the bare knuckle. Yeah, he did. Got a lot. Got a lot of good stuff there. And, and uh, 
I think he's got to get out for you, John, because you were up for World MMA Awards, Journalist of the Year. He wasn't. So I don't know if you can count on his vote. Oh, it comes down to the nitty-gritty, you know what I mean? That's probably why he laid out on I me. Mean, yeah. So. We'll be right back after this break. Goes. Start your day with SiriusXM. Enable the SiriusXM skill on your Amazon device and then tell Alexa to set an alarm for your favorite channel and you'll wake up to the sounds of SiriusXM. With SiriusXM and Alexa, you get the latest sports news each morning without picking up your phone or turning on the damn TV. Showtime in Tennessee. What's up, Showtime? It's your time. What's going on, fellas and Mr. Morgan? Yes, sir. Hey, guys. I, what's wrong with the, um, the feed on YouTube and Facebook? Facebook. I kind of got in late, so I, I didn't know. I, I, I thought y'all might have been on vacation again. For the time being, YouTube. we're just going to be on YouTube. YouTube.com forward oh. slash okay. MMA Junkie Video. So we're going to do a couple minutes of overtime today. So Series 6 m audience, if you ever pull over or you're catching us or you want to catch the overtime, go to YouTube.com forward slash uh, MMA Junkie Video. Try that right now, Showtime, while we work out the kinks. Put you on hold, and I'll come right back to you. I promise. Don't hang up. We got to get this one out of the way. Folks, it's time for the Daily Debate. Which 2018 fight would you most want to see rematched? A, Miocic versus Nganu. B, Romero versus Rockhold. C, Romero versus Whitaker. Or D, Gaston versus Souza. Dan Tom. If I had to pick from this list, I'm going to have to say Rockhold versus Romero because I think we saw a fair shake of skills versus uh, Miocic versus Nganu. I feel like... You know, well, Whitaker and Romero had two shots to see, to see how, how their, their their skills shaked out. And uh, the other one, uh, Gaslam and Souza, uh, it was a fun, compelling fight. But I believe, again, a fair shake to see how the skills uh, went. Whereas, last minute uh, stand-in, uh, miss weight by Yoel Romero. Uh, there's some foggy stuff with that uh, UFC 221 meeting down in Australia. I wouldn't mind seeing it run back. Goes. I'm going to go with Nganu and Stipe Miocic. I just remember how much fun I had watching it the first time. And I felt like all he needed was a little bit more time to get better at a few couple things, and we'd have a hell of a fight. And even if he doesn't, they're heavyweights. They get in like that. John Morgan? You know, it's funny because 
I thought I was going to be the one that was going out on a limb saying that fight. I mean, from a competition standpoint, Romero Whitaker, they've had a couple of classics, right? But I feel like Whitaker has done enough that he doesn't have to mess with Romero anymore. He beat him twice. One time he didn't make weight. I think, I think Whitaker has the right to say, peace, Yoel. Have fun up at 205. Uh, so, yeah, I think I'd like to see Miocic and Nganu. I mean, I know it wasn't the most competitive fight, um, and, and I feel like Nganu, you know, kind of wilted under the pressure of the moment, but I, I feel like it was a good learning experience. So am I saying, you know, necessarily we got to run it back in, in two weeks? No, but – I kind of want to see those guys square off again one time. I, I don't think Nagano got to show everything he's capable of doing. Yeah, you know, uh, sign me up for the big guys as well. You can't wow. go wrong with a rematch at, in the heavyweight division. But Nganu does have to show us tools mm -hmm. in his next couple fights that show us he can give us a strong three, four rounds rather than one and a half. All right, folks, Serious Six Mountains, you'll get more additional programming. Uh, the rest of you head on over for some OT. And by the, re by the way, the results came in the heaviest, 42% for Whitaker and Romero. How about that? That's a great fight. Oh, I wish that there were more than the 24 hours and... It's the third fight, and it's 2-0 in that series. So... I want to see it personally. I'm I'm not big on when someone's up two nothing on someone else. Yeah. But when my next guy and it's no disrespect to Gaston because he's done what he's been told and that's go out there and fight middleweights and he's having success. But when the next guy's really a guy who you can tell is just playing with house money and he wants to go back to welterweight soon, and then the rest of the guys are just beat up or looking to go to 205, it's like well. Yeah, I'll watch that again. You know, yeah. I, it wouldn't have been my first choice, but I, I wasn't shocked to see that was the leader. It was 42% for them, 30% for the heavyweights. I assumed that would be the winner, to be honest with you. I assumed that would be Because I get it, man. They were two great fights, right? And I mean, you, no matter how many times you match those guys up, I think they're going to have a great fight. Um, but I, I just don't think Whitaker should have to take that fight again. I, I just don't. At least not now. Yeah, definitely not now. Do you think some of it has to do with just some people are, are just a little soured on Rockhold lately? He, he seemed to be more of an exciting fan favorite type guy at Strike Force. Mm -hmm. And somehow, like, I look on forums and people just aren't into him like they were. And I don't know why. It's, I mean, all right, so he's off doing some modeling, you know, good for him. And so he surfs and maybe switch camps. I don't know. Or, or dated Demi Lovato. What's so bad about all that? You know what I mean? Like, I actually think that has a big big part to do think with so yeah. how mean, many times have you seen people go uh oh man he's dating a supermodel good for him <laughs> usually it's uh man, well, brady doesn't get guy. that type of hate yeah he does brady how many times do people bring up giselle for i brady? see a lot of jerseys out there oh uh, yeah and i think he got a little bit of hate for it and i don't think he deserved and then it with but Sousa i think gaslam, people, are, are people nasty love people. them some gaslam but i think Sousa people were disappointed that he was gassing so early in that fight mm, like yeah. that fight could have been better if he would have had more gas um I, I think it just boils down to sometimes you just gravitate towards certain fighters. And the, I think it, with that one, they're gravitating towards the matchup. Same with the other one. I think people like Ngana and Miocic. And Part of the other reason I voted for that was it just reminded me of boxing and having the heavyweights. Mm. It just you felt like there was this more going talk out. going in. People just like, everybody shut up. The heavyweights are about to yeah. throw down. I, it had that feel. I don't know. Let's bring back Showtime. Showtime. Continue, my man. We had to get that daily debate in. Oh, no, man. I love listening to you guys fight, man. Hey, um, OS Phil's a pretty slick cat on the ground, man. I'm, I'm pretty impressed with this dude, man. His, his jiu-jitsu, man, is, is, is slick, man. I mean, looking at, you know, the submissions he's got, man, I, I was very impressed by that fight, man. That was one of the little things that kind of stood out to me with, you know, with him getting hurt and being able to go to the ground and submit a nice up-and-coming fighter, man. That was a big win for OSP, no doubt about it, man. I mean, Tyson finished. Pedro is a, yeah. yeah, I mean, to fight out of that, and obviously Tyson Pedro, the, the respect that's there for him as an up-and-coming prospect. OSP, you know, I, maybe it's because he didn't perform the way he wanted to in the championship fight, or maybe it's because he doesn't, he doesn't talk a lot, you know what I mean? He's pretty laid back, reserved, doesn't have a lot to say. I feel like he doesn't get the respect that he deserves, man. I mean, he is, he's been around for a while fighting on the big stage, you know, starting to strike force, and, uh, you know, is always willing to get in there with anybody in this, I mean, I thought this was a tough assignment for him, and, and he uh, he got it done quick. So, uh, St. Saint, Saint Pru, dude, he's, he's somebody you, you definitely can't write off. I think consistency hurts him the most. Um, but really, if you look at him, it reminds me a lot of Rumble Johnson, right? He's got mm -hmm. that big physique. Um, he, everything he throws has power. You know, maybe Rumble wasn't really a submission machine in his day, but 
he has that to add. This is one of those cases where I think the UFC has tried to promote him, but I think OSP could do a little bit more on his end, especially with the college football background, like play off of that. And that goes back to like when we talked about Reebok, right? Didn't you kind of miss him coming in and all orange? That was his thing, right? Yeah. Tennessee. I wish he just had something like that. He's 35 yeah. years old, and I, I keep thinking, is he going to get better? Is he going to peak? And I'm thinking, did that happen? I don't know. Um, but he needed that win because if he didn't, he'd be stuck with putting over the younger guys, which is kind of almost what he did with Pedro. Uh, but now you can still say, well, you know, that's the one division where you only need a two, three, five win streak and you're back in that mix. He's had some key wins. He's had some hurtful losses. But Cormier's not fighting forever. Jones, you just don't know. John, do you know when they rule on Jones? It's supposed to be the next couple of weeks. Holy cow, we need to find out if that's going to be four years, two years, or time served. But we need to know what's going to happen there. Uh, Showtime. Thank you so much for always kind of playing ball and, and holding for us and all that yeah. stuff. All right, my man? Oh, oh yeah, guys. And I, I'll see you guys sometime uh, late next week. I was going to come out a little bit early, but it'll probably more, be more like Thursday when I, when I get out there, man. Come on out, brother. We'll see you then. Guys, over the weekend, uh, Bellator. You're going out to New York, huh? I'm going out to New York for the press conference, but then I'll be, uh, I'm, I'll be back, and then I'm going to Temecula as well. So I'll, I'll be on the uh, I'll be on the Bell Tour beat this week. Well, you guys want to discuss Bell Tour? You guys good for now? I'll go with what everybody else says. <laughs> <laughs> what do you want to bring up about Bell Tour? I okay. Over the weekend, I hear about Caldwell versus La Hot. I think they got something with Caldwell. I think he's a solid champion. Tough guy. I don't mind La Hot. I see him at Extreme. I've seen him on Swix podcast down in Thailand. Seems like a really funny dude. Um, real cool guy. But they got one of their champions fighting in a non-title fight in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. Please ask Scott Coker tomorrow, why are they going to so Sioux Falls, South Dakota? Like, I don't get that. Like, why not hold Caldwell and just have him defend at the next tent pole, at the next San Jose show or something? Like, I don't get some of these matchups. Rome, you know, they're going to Rome as well. Uh, and... and I, I don't know, man. I guarantee I, it's a sight view. First of all, let me say, as someone that's been to Sioux Falls, it is an underrated town. They actually have some pretty cool shit to do there. It's pretty. they got a lot of nice restaurants. But uh, big MMA scene up there, and my understanding is uh, I believe that that uh, venue pays site fees to get things. Because obviously – That's what keeps them afloat? If it, I mean, South Dakota is not really on everybody's you know travel and entertainment map for sure. LFA goes there a lot, LFA right? LFA goes there a lot. You see what there. It's the exact same venue, Sanford Pentagon. So I, I just wish I saw more – Strike Force type matchups. Back in the day when Strike Force had cards, we all said we always used to turn to each other and go, another Scott Coker special. Fun fights, we used to say. Why? Because they only did like six or eight cards per year. And then like four challengers that they sprinkled. Here, if they did the same thing, they if you look at their roster, it's pretty talented. And I know a few of them would have to face each other for the third and fourth time. You can only do Strauss and Pitbull for a certain amount of times. But I'll tell you what, I'll take Strauss and Pitbull, Pitbull part five over some of these other matchups that they come up with that just boggle my mind. Well, Scott Coker's special always used to be pretty one-sided matchmaking too, right? I mean, you, you kind of knew in Strike Force a lot of times. You're like, well, I'll take a red corner, red corner, red no, corner, but, red but corner. Do you remember, <laughs> like Rich some Chew Scott special. Smith versus uh, Robbie Lawler's. Sure. Oh, and, yeah. You know, there, there was so Daly's versus Nick Diaz's. I mean, maybe it was easier to promote some of the guys they had back then, but I, I don't know, man. Um, PFL closed the gap on Bellator more than Bellator's closed the gap on the UFC. And I didn't think that was going to happen, and it has. And PFL's existence is fucking two weeks, three weeks. If you throw out those first two cards that they had, it was just a, a transition with about six months off, and then boom. I think Bellator's going to pick up some momentum though the last half of this year. I think they've got, you know, they had, they've had a layoff, you know what I mean? There's, there haven't been events to talk about. Um, and now there's going to be you know more frequent events to discuss. And so maybe I'm not phrasing it right, but don't go to Rome and don't go to Sioux Falls. Pick one, and if it's Sioux Falls, and if it's a great town like you say, go there. But give us a fatter card, a juicier steak. You know what I mean? It's like these cards are just stripped down. Like I, I mean, Singapore was tough to wake up at 1.30 and get through some of those fights until we got to some of the names I was more familiar with. Some of these other promotions Did are doing like the same thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> like Dan said, he came out hard. <laughs> yeah, I need to keep an eye on you, Dong. I mean, you, that's two bonuses, you Dong earned. I mean, the UFC must like you, Dong. I've seen you, Dong, twice, and I've been impressed by it both times. <laughs> <laughs> You're in on you, Dong. I'm done with you, Dong. <laughs> <laughs> I, I I don't know. I mean, if you're gonna see the man tomorrow. 
just is there anything it can reveal to us as far as what what's I love the tournament, but I I just think that they are also spreading their roster. Like this is a guy Andre Korshkov that I like watching mm -hmm. fight. Yeah. All right. He can scrap. He's fighting a guy named Vaso Bakosovic. I'm not even excited about the matchup, but I'm excited about Korshkov. I'm also, you know, this is a fight that's taking place in it. I, I just think you could grab Korshkov in that main event and put him on Sioux Falls. And now you got more, more interested in Sioux Falls. Let's not forget they're competing against PFL, UFC, LFA. Uh, one is making themselves more friendly with the app. You only have a certain amount of hours in the day and you only have a certain amount of things. Don't forget Amazon, Hulu. Netflix, everybody that's doing their own original programming. Remember when HBO and Showtime came on the scene? They were a threat to Fox, NBC, and uh, CBS, and ABC as far as their programming. They were coming out with some innovative programming, curse words, nudity, you know. And, and so there's a lot of other places that are doing the same thing. Ghost told me about what's the name of Gamora uh, of mm -hmm. some Netflix special, Gamora, that he's saying is one of the greatest things ever. Wow. You know what I mean? But yeah. if I watch that. I may sacrifice something, and it may be the Bellator card in Rome. Well, if I don't have the t enough time. Not to mention I'll they're going to tape delay it. And they'll tape delay it. I'll that catch hurt. my highlights, come in here, get through it, take a call or two about it, and we're moving on. Well, see, I mean, we talk about the USC building stars too, like uh, Bellator, right? Ch check this out. I mean, this preliminary card for this, this week in Temecula is really, really good. In fact, I was actually talking to uh, Bellator. They're saying that every one of these fights is going to stream. Like, you know, sometimes they have dark post limbs afterwards. They're not going to do that. They're going to make sure. But I, I doubt – most people know this week. Joey Davis, Ed Ruth, Kerry Melendez, Tyro Fortune, all on the prelims. These are why are we not hearing about this? That's though? what I'm saying. That you know, even they can do a better job. These are these up and coming, you know, the up and coming fighters. A lot of talent there, and we're not really hearing a lot about it. You know, Fortune and Ruth could be their Cormier and Rockhold, or their Cormier and Woodley. Those guys came out of Challengers, then Strike Force, but we knew about them more because they did a better job of putting them on the map. When you spread yourself so thin. Hell, I don't even know if Coker likes jumping on all these planes. Yeah, well, and then again, I mean, how do you how do you program your card, right? I mean, your co-main event, Syed Awad versus Ryan Couture, definitely recognized names. Of course, obviously, we're you know buddies with Ryan, but do you want does that fight deserve to be where it is, or would you rather feature the the, the new generation, you know, the younger guys? I don't know. It's tough sometimes. Same with Valerie Returno versus Christina Williams. I mean. Of course, Valerie Returno is a, is a recognizable name, right? You brought mm -hmm. her over as a free agent, but would you be better served, you know, featuring one of those up-and-coming guys who may be the future mm -hmm. and, and getting them in front of people? Logan Storley is a beast for mm -hmm. Bellator. I don't think they've done a lot to feature him. I know he's going to be on that Sioux Falls card, so maybe that's when he'll start to get his shine. But I, I think they're, they've done such a great job of finding talent and talent evaluation, but then there's a disconnect, I think, between, like, finding and getting those guys and then turning them into the stars they need to be. Yeah. I, I love what PFL has done. But it's only been two weeks. I don't know if they've closed the gap as much as we're, we're making a town on Bellator. But they definitely put some pressure on them. Before we went to our last break, we kind of teased a little bit what we would do to spice up the UFC a little bit. Yeah. And create characters. I love what they do with the big Jumbotron and having everybody's entrance, at least on their main card. Um, it reminds me a lot of what WWE does when you hear the music. Dan Tom mentioned the little the bass noise. You know, everybody gets quiet. You hear that music. You hear the pop. You see the entrance. I like that, man. I wish the UFC would do something Which like that. Which was what I was saying. Let them come out in character. I when agree. they fight, mm -hmm. well, even they if can they wear come out Reebok in Reebok. Pant, you know, they get stripped down from uh -huh. a duster to their eventual Reebok shorts. Well, they could still come out in Reebok. They could still just promote have that. Reebok in certain things. But, I mean, I don't want to see a Reebok duster is what I'm saying. <laughs> um, <laughs> they come out as however they want so that you that remember who, you know. Yeah. Um, I think, too, I do want to say something about PFL because it's funny. I had this in my notes just because I was, I was going through this weekend, and we're all pretty high on what they've done so far, right? But I was programming in the, the dates for the rest of the season because they've announced them, and we just didn't have them in our back end when their playoffs are. It's a couple of weird things. After their, after their regular season ends, the playoffs go to Friday and Saturday. So, like, we were kind of like, hey, they're going to own Thursday nights. But then when they go to the playoffs, they go to Friday and Saturday, which I think is hmm. kind of weird. Like we just That's said, right. we love you for owning Thursday night. Now you're going to go up against USC and Bellator for your playoffs? Like, not sure if that's a good idea. The other thing, too, is the playoffs – now this is necessary just for the format, but the playoffs are October 5th, 13th, and 20th, and then the finals are December 31st. So you're talking, you know, six, seven weeks in between the, 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 the semifinals and the finals. Necessary, probably, to make sure everybody's you know healthy and, and able to compete for a million dollars. But I wonder if that's going to hurt their momentum and the, you know so they're going to build all this you know good good uh, good networking. Everything's going good where everybody's loving it, and then 
does it fall apart a little bit at the end? October, you're fighting baseball playoffs. Now NFL and college football are in full swing, especially on a Friday. Yeah. I don't know. All right, one last thing. What makes Dana White Contender Series pop so much that we all get – I mean, it's tomorrow, guys, and I'm stoked. I'm stoked to go and watch the fights, see who gets a contract. Even though, really, once they get the contract, we're not really that pumped up about the matchup per se because they're going to get buried – somewhere on, a, on another card where those other superstars are already fighting. I mean, yeah, it'll be cool for that moment, but what is it about the magic they have going on, and yet PFL and Bellator were thinking of ideas to keep them fresh? Part of it, I think. I mean, look, the positives there are there, there, obvious. You know, it is up-and-coming talent. It's quick. It's is it fast. a reality show? To a degree. Okay. No, I mean, I wouldn't classify it that way, but to a degree, especially that sitting in the kitchen part waiting on everybody to get a call. That's the reality show part. But, um, no, listen, I, I think the, the, obviously the, the quickness of it, the fact that you're taking, you know, fast upcoming talent. I mean, these are skilled and talented people. I think the other thing, too, though, is I think it's the fact that, that we're in the building, too. You know what I mean? Like, I, I don't know if necessarily everybody that's watching on Fight Pass gets the same kind of buzz. We do. I know it's well-received. But we're pretty fortunate because we get to be in that little tiny building with hardly anybody there, you know, watching it four feet in front of you, which I think definitely adds something to it as well. You know, believe it or not, I've never seen it on my laptop. <laughs> Me neither. Because if I haven't been there, it's because I can't watch it all together. So you're right. Maybe it is the fact that we're sitting there. Do you think there it's cool? You're, you've on. watched it on both. Uh, from uh, I, You know, like, like you guys said, whether you're watching it live or in person, I think it it's right there. It's short. It's digestible. It's new for all those reasons. But one one thing I will say, touching back on something John said about uh, the old Scott Coker matchmaking, which uh, you know I always call the old Rich Chu matchmaking. If we want to get technical about it, but we're kind of seeing that on the Contender series, and I'm not complaining about it by all means. I'm not complaining about the Contender series or even about that matchmaking. But have you guys seen that too? That kind of trend, and I almost think it's to add on to that. I almost think it's necessary because the level that you're bringing in, it can be dangerous if you match these guys up too well. You could have a slog and clench warfare battle that people complain about when you have high level pros, much less lower level guys doing it. So you almost kind of need these, these these smash matches. But do you think that has something to do with why 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 it's being received so well? You do kind of. I mean, listen, you do kind of need some of the the, the one sided matchmaking when you when you build things because. Uh, you know, as you said, no, so a lot of times when number one and number two fight in the world, you know, it ends up being kind of a slow-paced fight. So sometimes you, you do got to have a little bit of that. Especially if you're dealing with lower, lower, lower level talent, right? It can get really uh, ugly to your viewers if. Uh, and think of that. You know, boxing's really one of the only ones that people talk about just the main event. But really, like even if you go to WWE, it's not always about the main event. Like sometimes that intercontinental title steals the show, right? <laughs> Dude, that could be a whole other conversation. But I'm just curious. I, I try watching a little bit of it just to see. Like, look, The Undertaker's coming back, right? And I still I left. Start getting in the training. I thought he retired. <laughs> I thought he retired with that last WrestleMania. I just thought he was 50 and done. But everyone's pretty pumped up. He's going to Madison Square Garden. But here's what I don't get. Why I do, do pro wrestling fans just love it so much that they don't? give a shit like they're just in love with these guys or gals i don't think they care that they're cashing a check they're not competing for a world title they're just coming out so what is it, what entertainment are they giving them that makes them get so excited mma fans aren't like that J in japan they were when guys would lose a lot of, i think it kind of goes back to that right i mean again the pro wrestling does have roots in japan as well but i, I, think I gotta imagine a lot of that mentality comes from there they where, where like, they're gonna honor it's not about he's old he's not about that he's not in his prime like we get to see you know cowboy we get to see whoever fill in the blank uh who's the name um, I, I gotta imagine i mean I know that's why i would watch guys where i'd be like you know oh I, even guys i wasn't like they too, did. Too, too big a pig on him. I, why, why do I want to see Ric Flair come back? They love Sakuraba, man. man. Sometimes he'd go through a three-fight losing streak, but the Undertaker is not any – he's nowhere near being, like, hmm. at his peak or on any form of a win streak. I mean, it just doesn't matter, and, and some outcome is going to be predetermined, but I just don't get why people fall in love with some of these guys and they can't do it for MMA when it's as raw as it gets. I don't understand it. I'd, I'd literally die. Like, if you don't, if you like wrestling, I'm not saying anything wrong with liking wrestling, but I really don't understand how you could, like, oh, I love pro wrestling. How about MMA? Nah. 
Like, I love fake fights, bro. Fake fights, I'm down. Real fights, I'm out. Like, what? <laughs> I, don't, I, I just don't get it, man. You know what I mean? Like, I'm not hating on people right. that are pro wrestling fans. I, I get it. I think, I but they'll tell you. They'll you tell like you. Pro wrestling and not like MMA. They'll throw this big blanket over you and just go, it's entertainment value. But no one's really defined it. What's the entertainment? No. So they're all the ladders, the chairs, and Maybe because certain it's things. Fresh, but like that same core group you know you're going to see from you're going to hear from them again the next week as where some of these guys they go away and then the ufc tries to feed you a whole new group maybe. of guys i think maybe that's what it is that's true maybe that's that is true. yeah you can k- keep building on the same people over and over and over then again i'm not a nerd so i don't know <laughs> 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 i don't know all right well let's get on out of here we'll be back tomorrow with another edition john we'll see you in about a week or so yes, sir. Yes, sir. Right, you'll be out at temecula covering oh well, first the big apple yeah i head out to new york so we'll have full coverage for the press conference there and then i'll fly back and then go to temecula Dis- a big distribution announcement for it's belgium it's gotta be something online it's gotta be something online hopefully no more tape cures. delay hopefully it cures the tape delay yeah. on the west coast oh. and uh honestly Please. paramount is i i uh i yeah yeah, it's kind of like Lifetime a little bit at times. Lifetime? I can honestly yeah. say I haven't watched anything on Paramount other than Bellator. You haven't yeah. watched anything on Lifetime? <laughs> nah. Spoiler alert, the yeah. guy did it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Spike. I remember That's Spike. Right. There was girls like in loose tops <laughs> skipping rope yeah. and all these crazy shows. and Trampolines. Yeah. And, and uh, I don't know. All right. Let's get on out of here before I get in some trouble. Uh, <laughs> for John and Danny and Dan and Goes, I'm George. Have a nice day. Go out there. Be a champion. Oh, you